as I said earlier, identify an alternative location for delivery uh, with their other uh, local partners. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 14448 in the name of Derek Mackay on empowering Scotland's island communities. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move the motion. Minister, 14 minutes. Presiding officer, I am delighted to open this afternoon's debate on empowering Scotland's island communities. Firstly, I want to reflect on the journey we have taken and the progress made since the launch of the Our Islands, Our Future campaign by the three island councils and the establishment of the Islands Area Ministerial Working Group in 2013. The publication of the Empowering Scotland's Island Communities Prospectus in June 2014 produced the most comprehensive package for empowering Scotland's island communities ever put forward by any government. It was quickly followed by my appointment as Islands Minister, providing a focus and a voice for all of Scotland's 93 inhabited communities at the heart of government. The Government's commitment to our islands was further strengthened when the First Minister announced in her first programme for government her intention to reconvene the Islands Ministerial Working Group to continue the focus of addressing the challenges our island communities face and to consult on potential measures for inclusion in a future Islands Bill. The Ministerial Group reconvened in February and I now want to touch on some of the progress that has been made. On transport, we are clear about the significant contribution our lifeline ferry services make to the social, cultural and economic well-being of our islands. We have invested over £1 billion in our ferry services since 2007 and most recently continued investment has allowed us to complete a rollout of road equivalent tariff fares on the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services this month and support CMAL as they finalise the award of contracts to Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited for the building of two 100-metre vessels. We have listened to views expressed around the timetabling, and as I announced on the 22nd of September, CalMac are consulting widely with island communities on the detail of proposals for enhanced 2016 summer sailings. We are committed to affordable ferry fares and I am therefore pleased to announce to Parliament today a freeze on fares for 2016-17. This is across all Scottish Government subsidised ferry services and this includes passengers' cars and commercial vehicles. During my recent visit to Shetland, I announced a comprehensive study of the Northern Isles service. This is to be carried out to inform the tender process for the next contract due to begin in April 2018. We will continue to engage with key partners as part of that process. We will also work closely with both Orkney Islands Council and Shetlands Islands Council in considering their internal ferry services. Building on this, I have agreed to establish a strategic islands transport forum, a specific ask of island councils. The forum will meet biannually and membership will include local authorities and other key stakeholders. The first meeting will hopefully take place shortly. On air travel, the Government has made significant capital investment in purchasing new Twin Otter aircraft for the three routes between Glasgow and Barra, Tyree and Campbelltown, which we support. These are already in operation on these routes on a much improved frequency. We have also extended the air discount scheme to 2019, which is expected to cost around £6.4 million this year, alongside the significant cost of running Hyals airports. I do, however, recognise and understand the concerns around the cost and reliability of air travel to and from our islands. The Government is keen to help address these issues and is working with stakeholders to achieve improvements. I have met Scott Preston, who started the online campaign, and also recently with Logan Air. Logan Air have outlined a range of initiatives to enhance engineering support through its network to improve reliability, a review of scheduling to improve punctuality, and I would hope passengers start to see the benefits of these initiatives very soon. Fares are set by Logan Air, of course. Liam MacArthur. 
very grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention. I, I bear the scars of the latest delay uh, coming down from Cutwell this morning. Has he established a time frame with Loganair for um, these, uh, the range of measures that I know they're undertaking to actually take effect so that we see the improvements in reliability of those lifeline services? Minister. It's a fair question from Mr MacArthur. There is a Loganair board meeting uh, this week, which I think will discuss this uh, and other matters, and they do have a plan around engineering support and capacity and parts for the aircraft as well. Obviously, I want to ha that to happen as soon as possible so we can start to see improvements around uh, reliability and support for the aircraft because of the, the nature of them. Safety is never compromised, but I want reliability uh, to improve, and some of that can be around the scheduling and timetabling initiative. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Minister, for taking another intervention. Uh, would the Minister be aware that some uh, islanders are concerned that uh, some of the planes are occasionally pulled from island services to serve uh, more lucrative routes? Uh, can the Minister investigate this claim and to see whether that practice can be stopped? Minister? I'm happy to raise that with the operators when I meet them again, but both issues are really around reliability and the cost of air fares. And I think even the campaigners recognise that in terms of air fares, there are costs associated with servicing the islands, and this is not about sheer profiteering as it has been described. There are genuine cost pressures on the operator, but I'm happy to raise that matter amongst the other matters that I've raised with them when representing uh, island communities. But I do want to return to the air fares issues. Although fares are set by Logan Air, as they are by any other airline, and reflect the cost of operating the fleet, including staffing, fuel, airport charges, and of course air passenger duty on the northbound sectors, as with other airlines, advanced bookings are generally cheaper than those booked last minute. However, our understanding of the cost of travel and of the lifeline nature of these services means that we as a government want to do more. I'm therefore pleased to advise Parliament today that we will increase the air discount scheme discount from 40% of the core fare to 50%. That will be the maximum allowed under the terms of the scheme and this increase will apply to bookings made on or after the 1st of January next year. And I'm sure that this extension will be welcomed across Ireland and more remote communities in Scotland. On energy delivery of new strategic grid links to Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles remain a top priority for the Scottish Government. We continue to press the UK Government directly and through the Scottish Island Renewables Delivery Forum on its clear commitment for a viable support package for remote island wind generators. We are doing everything we possibly can to influence the key players, UK Government, Ofgem and Scottish Hydroelectric Transmission by encouraging positive direct action and, importantly, promoting continued cooperation between them. On community renewables, communities across the Scottish Islands are already reaping the benefits of hosting or owning renewable energy projects with support through the Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, CARES. Fuel poverty is another challenging issue affecting our island communities and one which was discussed by the island's ministerial group in July. We believe that all people in Scotland should live in high-quality, sustainable homes which they can afford to heat. Fuel poverty spreads far and wide through both our urban and rural communities, and that's simply not good enough. That's why we've allocated over half a billion pounds since 2009 for our fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes. And we've increased our investment in domestic energy efficiency, making a record £119 million available this year. This will give more households living in fuel poverty access to measures to make their homes warmer and more energy efficient. But we recognise that more remains to be done and we have established a new Scottish Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force that will explore issues around fuel poverty in rural areas and report their findings next year. Providing, of course. I, be I thank the Minister for taking an intervention and would, one, would wonder if the Minister might consider uh, making a commitment today to look very specially at island communities in relation to fuel poverty, uh, and th I think that would be helpful to islanders. Minister? Uh, yes, I absolutely, we'll do that, and that work will return to the Islands Area Ministerial Working Group. So, yes, I'll make that commitment today. Providing access to high quality digital connectivity 
is another high priority for the Scottish Government. At yesterday's convention of the Highlands and Islands, the Deputy First Minister chaired a discussion between Council's BT and the major mobile operators on improving coverage across the Highlands and Islands. This in addition to the government schemes where we're supporting community access, such as Community Broadband Scotland, can make a difference. Earlier this year, Community Broadband Scotland provided almost £1 million to a group of island communities in Argyll for a project, Giga Plus Argyll, and more than 1,400 homes and businesses are set to enjoy high-speed uh, broadband. A similar project will be rolled out on Sky and other projects are in the pipeline. We're also looking at the potential use of white space technology. White space is a wireless technology using spectrum freed up by the move to digital TV. And this pilot will also test the capabilities of white space in a ferry terminal. We want to make significant improvements to mobile coverage and we recognise it's of vital importance to island communities. In March this year, we provided 3G and 4G mobile services in the island of Col in partnership with Vodafone and the islanders themselves, whose mast is a community asset. And we're assessing how this model can be replicated elsewhere, potentially using European funding. We've also changed the permitted development rights, making it easier to upgrade existing mobile sites to increase coverage. And we'll continue to apply more pressure uh, on UK government. On Crown Estate, I welcome the involvement of island authorities to the recently established stakeholder advisory group on the Crown Estate. The devolution of management and revenues of the Crown Estate in Scotland presents a genuine opportunity to deliver added benefit to Scotland and local communities. While we do not believe the Scotland Bill clauses on the Crown Estate currently making their way through Westminster truly reflects the Smith Commission proposals, our focus is ensuring the devolution of the Crown Estate to this Parliament takes place in a workable way. There will be a wide consultation on how best to manage Crown Estate assets in Scotland for the longer term. And we have already committed through the Islands Ministerial Group to ensuring coastal and island communities benefit from the net revenue from marine assets out to 12 nautical miles. Uh, okay. Lewis MacDonald. Can the Minister confirm that uh, it is the Government's intention to implement the uh, aspects of the Smith Commission which refer to the further devolution of control of the Crown Estate to island authorities. Minister. We are consulting on the structure at the moment. Once we have clarity in how the administration, the regulation and the planning will actually work, we will be able to say more. But we are involving the island authorities in the, the future structure of the Crown Estate uh, in Scotland. But our commitment, as laid out in the prospectus on local and community benefit, I think is very clear to ensure that for the first time local communities can benefit from the Crown and Estate from the Crown Estate in a way that we weren't previously able to do. If I can touch on education, it's another example of an area in which we are working closely in partnership with the island authorities, having held a summit fairly recently. Last Wednesday I launched a consultation paper on a future islands bill. This will seek views on a range of issues including placing a legal duty on ministers and relevant public bodies to island-proof their functions and decisions, consider what additional powers could transfer to island councils and communities, and whether there's merit in the government producing a national islands plan, asking the question, should statutory protection be provided to the West Nile Scottish Parliamentary Constituency Boundary, and whether the Local Government Boundary Commission in Scotland should have the discretion to recommend wards with fewer than three councillors to take account of specific island circumstances. This paper is the start of a conversation. It deliberately does not seek to be too prescriptive. This is an opportunity for ideas to be shared and considered before any decisions are made, and I encourage everyone with an interest to respond. Finally, I plan to hold an Islands Communities Conference in early 2016. During the summer, I was struck by the many positive examples of community initiatives taking, across, taking place across our islands. I therefore want to provide a platform for ordinary islanders to come together to share best practice and learn from each other. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I am very focused on a more prosperous future for all of Scotland's 93 inhabited communities, and I move the motion in my name. Many thanks, Minister. And I now call on Ken McIntosh to speak to and move Amendment 14448.2. Ten minutes, please, Mr McIntosh. 
I thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister and the Government for bringing forward the subject of Scotland's islands for debate this afternoon. I would not ever pretend to be an islander, uh, but as someone who lived in Skye, who went to school there even briefly, uh, and who has returned there every year since, I do admit to an affinity and an affection for island life. I also know enough to realise that my experience of the Hebrides and other Scottish islands as a visitor is not the same as those who live there all year round. And in fact, for all of those who visit our beautiful islands on a crystal clear spring day and are tempted to up sticks and uh, move home immediately, the best advice I've ever heard is spend the winter there first. Yes, island life is enticing, romantic even, but it can also be harsh. The problems we wrestle with as MSPs on behalf of our constituents across Scotland, such as inadequate housing, fuel poverty, and poor transport connections are there on our islands too, but in spades. And the needs and desires of the people who do live in Scotland's islands are no different from anyone else's. They want a decent job, a warm home, access to the best education and healthcare. Islanders might enjoy their own remoteness, but they want to be part of the modern world, or at least not to miss out on it or to be overlooked. Now I'll return to the importance of work and being able to earn a decent living later, but before I do, I wanted to at least acknowledge in passing why the islands have been so instrumental in shaping Scottish Labour's values and our vision for this country of ours. There is much in Scotland's history in which we can look back with pride, but we would also do well to remember the scar that was the clearances. The legacy and unfairness of poverty-stricken crofters, absentee landlords and a land ownership system that entrenched inequality can still be seen today. It was no accident that Labour used the first session of this new Parliament to bring forward the Land Reform Act, still one of the most important pieces of legislation this Parliament has ever passed. We supplemented that Act with a series of practical measures designed to support the local economy on the islands, to invest in our health service and build new schools. And as the Minister uh, and the Government begins to consult on a new islands bill, I think the Minister would do well to also bear in mind the weaknesses of their own legislative record on crofting and land reform and hopefully learn from those experiences. And turning to the forthcoming bill and the current consultation, I would thank my uh, Liberal Democrat colleagues uh, and Liam MacArthur in particular for reminding us in his amendment today of the origins of this proposed legislation. I don't mind saying that one of the more welcome offshoots of the build-up to the referendum was the establishment of Our Islands, Our Future campaign by three island councils. The campaign highlighted that for a resident in Lerwick, for example, there is little difference between centralised control from London and centralised control from Edinburgh. Today is a relatively consensual debate, I hope, uh, but again I believe it is at least worth highlighting that there is nothing in the government motion about devolving more fiscal powers to the islands. I think a very interesting test of the Scottish Government's mettle, and this is a question that my colleague Louise MacDonald and I think Travis Scott were about to ask, will be when they finally decide what to do with the Crown Estate. Will they support Labour's position, and in fact the position they signed up to in the Smith Commission, of devolving control to our islands and our local authorities directly, or whether they will uh, be tempted to hang on to some of the power and, of course, some of the money? Presiding officer, although we will be supporting the government's motion today, there are several other issues not included or mentioned, but which I would argue are of crucial importance to most islanders. The first I want to highlight is that of transport, and in particular the affordability and the reliability of air services to the island, uh, mentioned by the minister in his opening remarks. As I'm sure the minister will know, uh, the, there is only one operator, Flybe, serving the islands through their franchise partner, Logan Air. And over the last 12 to 18 months, I've been informed there have been a huge rise in the numbers of delays and cancellations. And I believe the minister himself or certainly one of his colleagues have experienced this directly. And I certainly know that uh, my colleagues in the Rural Affairs Committee uh, in the recent, did in the recent visit to Isla and Jura, uh, Jura and Isla. They were delayed by three and a half hours on the way out and a further couple of hours on the way back. And it's not difficult to see the impact this might have on local residents, on public services and on businesses. Hospital appointments at Rigmore, in Inverness or in Glasgow are regularly cancelled. Uh, onward travel connections missed and other business meetings uh, rearranged or dropped. Mr Gibson. Rob Gibson. Thank you for uh, taking this intervention. Just a slight correction. Two of the members went by ferry and were not delayed at all. That was three different ferries and arrived in Jura for a meeting of a quarter of the population in time. 
Ken McIntosh. Yes. I, I'm, I'm glad Mr Gibson travelled on the, the, public, the service that's still in public ownership. Um, and uh, it, it actually caused my colleagues some anguish that they took the plane and actually would have been quicker on the ferry with Mr Gibson. So, but thank him for highlighting that point. And, and just the, the um, unreliability uh, of our, our air services, coupled with uncertainty over the future of the ferries, is very damaging for business confidence and investment altogether. Now, as to why the air services are proving increasingly unreliable, some have pointed to the ageing stock with many planes more than 25 years old, a fact acknowledged by the Minister, in fact. Others have commented on the number of times aircraft are dragged off to serve other more profitable routes, a question I asked the Minister. But these island routes do receive government subsidy, and it is important that they work for the islanders they are supposed to serve. As it is, the cost of flying to the islands is already off the scale. Even booking months in advance, a return flight to Stornoway, for example, would cost more than £250, with very few of these so-called economy or budget seats available. More likely would be £370 return. In other words, enough to fly a whole family to Spain and back. Now, I remember very well when Labour and the Liberals introduced the air discount scheme, uh, preceded, as I call, uh, recall, by the Rural Transport Fund, in fact, it is time for an immediate review of these air services, at the, very loose, at the very least looking at the business model used, the size and the investment in the aircraft and the number of seats available. The SNP has already drastically reduced the air discount scheme, but in many cases the costs have simply been shunted to other parts of the public service. As it is, a majority of seats on many journeys are often taken up by the public sector, with flights to hospital paid for by the NHS just being one frequent example. Should those flights not perhaps be capped? This is not something that these prices, I should say, not the flights, but the, the prices perhaps be capped. This is not something that can be fobbed off by ministers indefinitely, and, in minister, and islanders want to hear words of commitment, not woolly expressions of sympathy. In fact, the issue of air services flags up one of the anxieties some islanders have with the Scottish Government's agenda as a whole. Greater autonomy is to be welcomed, but if there are no resources to accompany greater control, it is very much a double-edged sword. Housing, for example, is another area which exemplifies this concern, where a more locally tailored approach would pay dividends, but where that is no excuse for underfunding from the Scottish Government. No matter where you go on Scotland's islands, the lack of affordable housing emerges time and time again as the biggest single worry. Without it, young people cannot remain in their community or cannot return after leaving for college or university. Key staff needed to support local services have nowhere to live and young families have nowhere to set up home with an immediate knock-on effect on local schools and shops. Rural areas generally have half the level of social housing you would see in the rest of Scotland and more worryingly, half the level of investment. Even within islands, housing need creates population shifts. There are often so few houses available for social rent that people end up moving to the main towns, such as Portree, or, of course, to the mainland. Housing need is consistently underestimated. Areas of relative affluence can occasionally obscure pockets of need, but more likely, in small villages, people will simply not join a council waiting list when they know there are no council houses in their community. Unlike in the rest of Scotland, where the private sector has doubled in size in recent years to meet that demand, on the islands, rented accommodation is often prioritised for the holiday market. In fact, it is very common for young people to rent one of those holiday homes for the winter, moving into a caravan for spring and summer and then back again. Now, there are many reasons why affordable housing is a particularly acute problem on Scotland's islands. The unavailability of land is one factor, for example. But perhaps the most important as usual, is simply to do with finance. In rural areas, there can be high development costs, but few economies of scale, with only a few houses on each site. And as we all know, the SNP government's decision to cut the level of grant to housing associations has had an effect across the country, but it has proven particularly problematic in island communities. And yet, we also know where community initiatives are successful and housing is built, such as on the Isle of Gia, it has helped double the population. Housing is absolutely essential to rural and island development. Presiding officer, there's nothing in the Minister's motion today that we object to, and I hope we will be able to work constructively on any legislation brought in following the Government's consultation on a future islands bill. What is noticeable, however, is that the Government's motion concentrates on process when what is really needed right now is practical action. Ward boundaries are important, but what I'd like to hear from the Minister and his backbench colleagues 
is how he intends to tackle poverty, build warm homes, or allow more people to go to college. The sort of steps all of us across Scotland want to see, but which have a particular importance in fragile, remote or dispersed communities. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move Amendment 14448.1. Six minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. All my adult life, and probably for a good number of years before that, I've been driven by a desire to see powers delivered to our island communities. For me, the establishment of this parliament was always only part of the story, a process, not a one-off event, certainly, but more than that, it was about devolving power within and not just to Scotland, recognising, as all good Liberals in the fine traditions of Joe Grimm and Joe Grimm do, that power rests with the people and is passed up and pooled only by consent and where necessary. It is about giving people and communities the tools they need to shape their own future, trusting them to take decisions on their own behalf rather than a top-down minister knows best approach. So I'm delighted to be able to contribute to this debate and grateful to Derek Mackay for lodging his motion. We may and do have our differences, but I've always found the minister approachable, courteous and willing to take seriously issues that are raised with him. Despite that, the SNP government's track record on actually empowering our islands is not as the minister has characterised it, with powers removed from rather than devolved to our island communities. The publication of the government's consultation on empowering island communities is undoubtedly welcome, but it stands in stark contrast, I would argue, with the behaviour of this government since 2007. There is, of course, the untimely demise of the historic Concordat, an agreement once proclaimed by every minister in every speech as guaranteeing parity of esteem between the Scottish Government and local authorities. The Concordat lasted about as long as it took for the First Council to point out that a never-ending council tax freeze added to a host of unfunded SNP promises in education, housing, etc., was wholly incomp incompatible with government rhetoric. Now local authorities are scapegoated for pretty much anything. The SNP's treatment of our island communities is scarcely any better. Mr Mackay's, ap Mr. Mackay's appointment as the Minister with responsibilities for the island is one I welcomed, but we need to see more evidence of this delivering uh, change in government policy and government approach. And I'll give way to Mike, Mike McKenzie. Uh, I, I wonder if uh, Mr MacArthur would acknowledge at least that Orkney Island Council, the constituency that he represents, enjoys one of the highest per capita settlements of any council area in Scotland. Liam MacArthur. I, I mean, this kind of shows Mike McKenzie's willingness to simply be a spokesperson for the SNP rather than to recognise his constituents, who, if he was doing his job properly, would recognise that Orkney Islands Council, amongst others, has been the most critical of the historic underfunding of the council. So despite the welcome freeze in ferry fares for next year, Orkney and Shetland remain the only island communities excluded from the government's cheaper ferry fares. And likewise, while warmly welcoming the Minister's agreement to uh, agree to the request that Tavis Scott and I made earlier in the summer to lift ADS support to 50%, nevertheless, all island bu businesses still face 40% higher airfares thanks to the SNP Government's previous cut to the ADS. And police, meanwhile, in all three island communities continue to grapple with a botched centralisation that undermines accountability and the ethos of community policing that has been the hallmark of island forces. In terms of the consultation, as Labour's amendment rightly acknowledges, it is, of course, a response to the campaign driven by the three island uh, uh, authorities, one for which they deserve both recognition and real credit. Yet, interestingly, the case for empowering our island communities was not always so fondly received by SNP ministers. It wasn't mentioned in Mr Mackay's uh, opening recap of the recent history of this, in, uh, of this issue, but I well recall that when Tavish Scott and I made a very similar case for giving more powers and responsibility to the Northern Isles we represent, it was met with a torrent of invective from SNP spokespeople. The then Deputy First Minister, down to a range of dutiful backbenchers, lined up to denounce us as troublemakers and indeed worse. Yeah. Having been put in a flat spin by the notion that our islands might be lukewarm on the idea of seeing power centralised in Edinburgh as opposed to London, the SNP have sought to react. Yet to date, this U-turn in rhetoric has not seen a U-turn on centralisation. Take, for example, the centrepiece of the government's consultation, a commitment to island-proof legislation and decision by ministers, perfectly reasonable as a concept. 
Yet let's view this commitment in the context of what has gone before. Based on the SNP's track record, there seems little likelihood of island proofing lasting any longer or being any more meaningful than the historic Concordat. The First Minister's attainment fund provides a perfect illustration, a central plank, we're told, of this government's overriding priority. It aims to provide additional support for those children from, from more disadvantaged backgrounds who need it. I'm pretty confident that Tavish Scott, Alistair Allen and I could all identify areas in our own constituencies directly affected by poverty where the targeting of this sort of resource could make a huge difference in improving the life chances of children in our islands. Sadly, because of the way the, this government thinks, its broad branch approach to policy, which inevitably sees the interests of the central belt prevail. There was never a prayer of my constituents might benefit from the attainment fund. The bottom line is that island proofing will need to be more than a tick box exercise. It will need to require a different way of doing things, a recognition that ministers don't know best, that one size does not fit all, and that island communities must be allowed both the power and the resources, as Ken McIntosh said, to make decisions that directly affect them. As luck would have it, there is a, an early opportunity for the government to demonstrate its willingness to turn over this new leaf. leaf. The Smith Commission, as our amendment indicates, backs calls by my colleagues Mike Moore and Tavish Scott to control over the seabed being passed to island and coastal communities. This call recognises that there is little to be gained by passing control of these vital assets from London to Edinburgh. Rather, it is the communities who most directly rely on these assets who need to have control and discretion over how they are used. Ministers have promised to pass on revenues, as the Minister did again this afternoon, but as well as providing a wonderful contrast with their demands for more powers for this Parliament, this less than munificent offer misses the point. Another crucial test for the government's concept of island proofing will be its approach to the delivery and funding of services, whether by the public or indeed the third sector. Too often in the past, funding allocations have been based on a per capita allocation. This ignores the fact that in order to deliver any service, there is a minimum level of funding needed. Without this base funding, it is highly unlikely that any sort of service can be provided or sustained, and this needs addressing. More generally, the additional costs of delivering services to a small, older population dispersed over a number of islands are not fully taken into account by the government. Last year, for example, we had the ridiculous situation where Scottish ministers were issuing press releases announcing that they had made good the historic underfunding of health boards in Orkney and Shetland. Yet a month later, their own published figures gave the lie to this assertion. Even now, any increase that has been provided to NHS Orkney will only pay back the borrowing needed to make up the shortfall in previous years. Could you this, come to a conclusion, This please? situation, I will indeed, Deputy President, Officer, this situation is not sustainable and puts unbearable strain on those charged with providing health and care in Orkney. Unless I Proofing addresses these sorts of practical issues, my constituents will question whether it is worth the copious amounts of paper it is written on. Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the appointment of an Islands Minister, in particular in the guise of Derek Mackay. I welcome the establishment of a ministerial group and publication of this consultation. However, it will be judged on what it actually delivers in practice and in terms of a change of mindset from a government which has relentlessly been centralising powers and decision-making, particularly over the last four years. And I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Mary Scanlon. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all um, welcome the consultation paper? And uh, I think it's only fair to welcome the announcements that we've uh, heard today, the three on Ferry Fairs 2016-17. Uh, I know will be absolutely welcomed also the Strategic Island Transport Forum. Air discount scheme extended, increased to uh, 50%. Uh, the one thing I would uh, say touches on the point that Ken McIntosh made, and that is that it's still much cheaper to go from Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen to many, many capitals of Europe, uh, significantly cheaper, but a quarter of the price uh, to go by air than to go to our islands. So I would like to see more done uh, so that more tourists can visit uh, our islands. Um, on fuel poverty, uh, I, I welcome the measures and uh, I, I would say that the, the mention about the community broadband, Tavish Scott and I uh, visited Mull on behalf of the Public Audit Committee and it had taken three years for these islands to get together, to work together. It's a long time just to get to that stage. I, I, and uh, before I go on to my main speech, um, I think almost uh, all... Uh, education and lifelong learning uh, 
committee meetings now start with apologies for Liam MacArthur. His plane has been delayed and today was no exception to that. Um, so I very much welcome the consultation paper. Um, it is over two years since Our Islands, Our Future was published jointly by the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland Isles. Uh, and Mike Russell did remind me that in the tea room that he represents more islands that are, in, are included in Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles. So let's not uh, uh, just look at those three groups of islands. But I want to put on record some of the excellent examples of governance in all our island authorities and in particular Shetland. Over the years, we've become accustomed to the problems relating to Shetland Islands Council, uh, particularly as a member of the Audit Committee, but these issues now seem to be historic, uh, and I think it's due thanks to the good management, teamwork and partnership on the Council, but also due to the excellent leadership of Malcolm Bell and Gary uh, Robinson. I think we should thank all our island authorities for bringing forward our islands, our future, which has brought us to this point today. Uh, my second point is that the three island authorities, as well as other islands in Argyll, are all very different. Their problems may be similar in terms of transport, infrastructure, broadband and the delivery of public services, but their histories and distinct identity, as well as local economies, are very, very different. And neither should it be assumed that this level of devolution to our islands is all about powers from Edinburgh to Lerwick, Kirkwall and Stornoway. Of course they are the main towns, but this is an opportunity to devolve power more locally throughout our islands. Uh, and I would like to highlight the distinct nature of uh, Wolsey, uh, where I visited on several occasions, and their museum and uh, local traditions are so much to be admired. Presiding officer, I hope you'll tolerate an anecdotal experience that I go back to the year 2000, when Duncan Hamilton, SNP, Margaret Jameson Labour, Margaret Smith Lib Dem and myself visited the Western Isles to consult in relation to the free personal care legislation a long time ago. Uh, we were told by some elderly ladies in Barra that they didn't want to end their days in Stornoway. As a matter of fact, they'd rather go to Glasgow. And having been born and lived on Barra all their life, they wanted to remain in Barra. And when their time came, they wanted that to be on Barra. So I use that as an example that local, it's not just all about Stornoway, it's about the local uh, islands and we need to respect them too. Part two of the consultation, island proofing, I noted this morning in the Higher Education Scotland Bill po Policy Memorandum that it already states that this is island proofed as well as equal opportunities. So I'm not sure if we're offering something that's already happening, but it was certainly in that document and I very much welcome, uh, welcome that. What would be helpful is to understand the process for island proofing. There's quite a bit about it in the consultation paper, but I do think that it would be helpful to make it more transparent, more accountable, let us know who you've listened to, let us know what you've done to island-proof uh, decision-making and legislation, rather than just a sentence to say, this is island-proofed. I think that would be very, very helpful. Uh, part three... Uh, on empowering, uh, I do think it's uh, possible to be much more innovative in delivering services on our islands. Uh, for example, to look at even closer integration and collaboration between public services. And I give the example of fire and rescue services, ambulance, the NHS, police and local authorities. There is much more that can be done to have something that's a bit more of a one-stop shop. I'm fed up seeing the fire stations closing here, the ambulance stations closing there. And I think the islands, with the smaller population, it's a wonderful opportunity to look at how better they can work together uh, and to be better integrated. Uh, I would also uh, suggest again in this section that what may be right for Shetland under the Zetland and Orkney County Council Acts of 1974, 
may just not be right for the Western Isles. And that's my only concern here. We should not assume that every island is homogenous uh, in that way. And finally, page 13 of the consultation document outlines the next stages. I notice it's a three-month consultation, which would finish at the end of the year. Um, but this obviously depends uh, on the responses. And I would like today, Minister, to get a direction of travel and some commitments to those responses, some recommendations and some proposals, at least prior to the dissolution of Parliament. That would be helpful. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of six minutes, please. Could members check that they have the request to speak buttons pressed, please, if they wish to participate. And I call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity of speaking in this debate, both as an islander myself and as a representative of the Highlands and Islands region, where most, and if not all, of Scotland's islands are in this vast region. And although I'm not an expert on any of them, except perhaps the one I live on, I'm familiar with most of them. And I can therefore say with some assurance that although each of our islands is unique, each with its own romantic and rugged charm, they all also, as Mary Scanlon has been saying, has much in common. And I do take Mary's point about centralism, because the centralism I see tends to be a centralism around the main towns of each island group, and not the centralism that we heard Liam MacArthur talking about. In fact, I would challenge Liam MacArthur to give me one example, one example of real tangible detriment as a result of this so-called centralism that he's talking about. If he would give me an example of one crime, one crime not investigated as a result of this so-called theoretical centralisation, I'd be very grateful to hear about it. Are you giving way, Mr McKenzie? Yes, sir. Thank you, Liam MacArthur. I'm grateful to Mike McKenzie for the challenge. I would uh, counter-challenge him to point to one police officer in Orkney who has had anything to, to say about the police centralisation. And I would commend them for their efforts in dealing with a bot centralisation that has not assisted them in their work whatsoever. Order, please. Order. Order. I thank Mr MacArthur um, for making my point for me. It seems he was not able to give one example. So as an islander and as a representative of the Highlands and Islands Region, President Officer, I'm pleased to welcome the consultation on the forthcoming Act as one more milestone of a journey that we've heard earlier, started in July of 2013, when at a Cabinet meeting in Lerwick, the then First Minister announced the formation of the Islands Area Ministerial Workings Group. This was the Scottish Government's first response to the Our Islands, Our Future campaign waged by the three island authorities seeking better opportunities for Scotland's islands. I remember that day in Lerwick well, a day of blue skies and warm sunshine. But I remember that there was also some uncertainty about whether the Cabinet meeting would go ahead, as there was a concern that the flights might be delayed or cancelled due to the possibility of sea fog that often accompanies such weather in Shetland. These are the uncertainties of travel that islanders live with in summer as well as winter. And this point, I think, was well noted by all present. Less than a year later, in June of 2014, I was in Orkney for the launch of the Scottish Government public publication Empowering Scotland's Island Communities, an 80-page document full of substantive proposals with the overall aim of levelling the playing field between Scotland's islands and our mainland areas, recognising the generations of regional disadvantage that our islands have suffered from. It's a thoughtful and comprehensive document, and it was warmly welcomed both by the island authorities and by island and coastal communities throughout the whole of the Highlands and Islands. And it's an important point, President Officer, that many of the proposals apply not just to the island authorities, but to all of Scotland's islands, 
and to our coastal communities, not least of which, as the Minister has touched on, the devolution of 100% of the Crown Estate revenues. I wish it was possible to devolve more of the Crown Estate revenues than that, but I understand it could not be more than 100%. But I can only contrast this with the lukewarm and the limpid response from the UK Government, which followed in the August of that year a document entitled A Framework for the Islands. I'm sure everybody's forgotten about this document. It comprised of no more than a few pages of warm words and nothing much else. It promised greater transparency of Crown Estate revenues, although these are still shrouded in fog, like Sumbera Airport on a summer's day. It promised a desk and an officer at the Scotland office to deal with island issues, although there is no evidence to date that this officer has done anything other than twiddle his thumbs. And underpinning the meaninglessness of this document is the caveat that this framework is a statement of political intent and it does not create legal obligations between the parties. It is intended to be binding in honour only. President officer, I can only reflect that as I contemplate the Unionist parties and their various promises to the Scottish people, the honour appears to be a very scarce commodity. By contrast, the Scottish Government has moved quickly to honour its commitments. If I have time... Order, please. If I have time, I'm willing to take Mr Macdonald's intervention. I will give you time back. Ken McIntosh. Mr. McIntosh, but, uh, would Mr. McKenzie perhaps care to confer with the Minister and get back on script? I think there's a consensual debate about Scotland's future. Mike McKenzie. It, from where I'm sitting, the speeches of Mr. McIntosh and Mr. MacArthur didn't appear to be all that consensual. So the Scottish Government has honoured its commitments to the Islands and moved quickly, first of all appointing the Minister Derek Mackay as Scotland's first. Islands Minister and then in proceeding for the preparatory work for Scotland's first Islands Act and the opening of this consultation. The proposals which form the basis of the consultation could be as profound as they are powerful, not least of which is the concept of island proofing, a recognition that what may work well in Edinburgh may, ne may not work well in Egglesey on you Egg You should draw to now, please, Mr McKenzie home island of Easdale. The possibility of further devolution of the powers and functions of our island authority is worthy of a debate in itself. A national islands plan is another, another possi powerful possibility. President officer, there is much in this consultation to occupy the thoughts of our islanders in what I think is the best opportunity that for our islands that I have known in my lifetime. I commend the Scottish Government's approach to our islands and urge all islanders to put their thinking caps on and respond to the consultation. Thank you very much. If members care to take interventions um, at this stage, I might be able to give a short amount of time back, but not a huge amount. Jane Baxter, to be followed by Michael Russell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll begin by telling my tried to get to the islands but couldn't get a flight story since everybody else has been doing that. Earlier this year, I tried to represent the Equal Opportunities Committee on a visit to Isla. I got to Glasgow Airport. The plane was overbooked. There was nothing anybody could do. I just had to go home again. But I got €250 Euros of a compensation payment. Seems quite a good deal, but I gave the money back to the Parliament. I'd like to put it on record. I didn't keep this compensation. I gave it back in. So Isla's loss was the Scottish Parliament's gain on that occasion. But I digress. For me, Scotland's islands bring many happy memories to mind. As a tourist, I've experienced their culture, their environment and their landscapes. I've hill walked in Skye, travelled by ferry to Mull and Iona, Harris and Lewis. I've crossed the Atlantic Bridge to Seal and Easdale. I've had a fantastic week in Orkney, visiting the historical cultural sites of interest. And I've been a guest of the Geyser Jarl at the Uphelia on Bressy in Shetland. So I'd be the first to agree that our island communities are a special part of Scotland. And although on the face of it, Scotland's islands may appear to face the same challenges as mainland communities, amongst those fuel, poverty, housing and transport, 
We need to ensure that they are equipped to deal with those challenges and the solutions and services required may differ from the mainland or indeed amongst different islands. From my previous existence as a community planning officer in Fife, I know how important it is that politicians and their officials listen to local people and to stakeholders when making decisions about policies and how resources are used. The Shetland, Orkney and West Miles councils through their Our Islands, Our Future campaign launched in 2013 have worked hard so that their concerns and ideas are heard. Their campaign has set out a vision for a stronger future for Scotland's island communities and called on both the Scottish and UK governments to commit to ensuring that the needs and status of island areas were clearly recognised in whatever emerged as the future governance arrangements for Scotland. And that's why Scottish Labour supports the work of the Our Islands, Our Future campaign. In recent years, they've made a strong case for empowering our island communities to address the, pro the problems their communities face, and we will continue to work with them to ensure that the anticipated islands bill meets their expectations. And the Scottish Government is now at the stage of consulting with interested stakeholders on plans for more power and protection for Scotland's islands to inform the future bill. And we must ensure, we must ensure that the, the islands can get a more prosperous and fairer future for their communities as a result of that bill. But I'd like to focus in my speech on one key aspect of that consultation, island proofing. The principle of island proofing as set out in the consultation document is about building a broad-based islands awareness into the decision-making processes of relevant parts of the public sector. In practice, it will involve the consideration of the particular needs and aspirations of island communities when the Scottish Government and other relevant public bodies exercise their functions. The Government is seeking views on whether it should have the power to issue statutory guidance to other public bodies and whether those bodies would be required to, would be required to adhere to that guidance. The consultation further asks which bodies should be included in the scope of that statutory guidance. Presiding officer, the issues outlined in the consultation document do seem to be considered fair and reasonable. A word of caution, however. In my experience, proofing for any of a range of scenarios, be it equality, rural, future or island, can too easily become a tick box exercise. If the assessment is to add real value, you have to take a participative approach to work of this nature, involving all stakeholders, and this will involve additional time and expense, but the results in the long term will be worthwhile. That participatory democracy, and with it the ability to robustly island-proof policy in the future, will be influenced by the outcomes of the Scottish Government's cons consultation, which as well as asking about island proofing, also raises, raises questions on empowering island communities, what additional powers and functions could be passed to island councils to benefit or better protect the island communities they serve? And would this be the same for all islands, or could there be geographical variations? A national islands plan, whether a legal duty should be placed on all future Scottish governments to prepare a national islands plan, setting out ongoing commitments across all policy areas of government to support, promote and empower our island communities. Statutory protection for the Western Isles Scottish Parliamentary constituency boundary as the only constituency in, in Scotland made up entirely of islands and not having this protection. And local government electoral wards, whether the local government boundary commission in Scotland should have discretion to recommend wards with less than three councillors so that populated islands are not placed in an electoral ward that contains a significant proportion of mainland population. And this is because of concerns amongst some island communities that their distinctive interests may not be represented in a larger council's discussions and that the island community may not have a councillor amongst its residents. Scottish Labour, in its 2015 manifesto, committed to use the powers of the Smith Commission to devolve more power to our island communities, to use new powers of the Scottish Parliament to devolve the administration and revenues of the Crown Estate to manage and develop their own seabed and foreshore. We also committed to ensuring our island communities a place at the heart of the UK Government, that involved a commitment to maintain the island desk in the Scotland office and convene a summit between the UK Government and Scotland's island councils twice a year. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, in conclusion, Scottish Labour will play a part in ensuring a strong deal for our island communities. I look forward to the progress of the bill and the opportunity to bring about a positive impact on the health, well-being and prosper prosperity of Scotland's islands. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Michael Russell to be followed by Stuart Stevens. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I very much welcome the opportunity that this Chamber has to debate the issues particular to islands in Scotland. And I want to congratulate the Scottish Government on this initiative, not just in bringing forward a debate, not just in bringing forward a consultation, not even bringing forward an islands bill. I want to congratulate the Government for having an islands minister. 
Uh, he may not be as enthusiastic, presiding officer, about his role as I am. That is perhaps because I write to him on a regular occasions. But I am the constituency member. Mary Scanlon was, was, as usual, very nearly right. I am the constituency member that represents most islands. Not all the island groups uh, altogether. They have more. But I represent more islands, and our Gowlin Butte Council has more islands within its area than any of the island authority, inhabited islands. And therefore, it is of concern to me that the island, it is the island authorities that are talked about in this debate all the time. It is the island authorities that the minister has been meeting with in the islands group. That is contrary to natural justice. It is unfair to the islands of Argyll and Butte. And I do hope the minister today will renew not just the commitment that the government has made to ensure that the Argyll Islands receive the benefits of the policies as they, they roll out, but also that he will endeavour to bring the Argyll Islands and Argyll and Butte Council into discussions of these matters, starting perhaps with the new strategic ferries group. I do think that the island authorities have shown a, a lack of solidarity and generosity in their attitudes. And I understand why, because in matters such as the Special Islands Needs Allowance, there is a question of a finite budget, and it does. The inclusion of the Argyle Islands does threaten some of that special financial treatment. But it is unfair to the Argyle Islands, it is unfair to the people who live on those islands. Now, there is much in the consultation that must be welcomed, and I've encouraged my constituents to make their own representations. Some, are some issues are particularly germane at this time. For example, changes to local government wards, which are currently being proposed by the Local Government Boundary Commission in its fifth review, will disadvantage the island areas of Argyll and Butte very severely. They will make the council even less accountable. And there needs to be changes to allow smaller wards and more local transparency. The type of changes that are applied presently in terms of, of, of both in ratio and parity to the island's councils but are not applied within Argyll and Butte. But the particular problem in Argyll and Butte, in addition to the island problem, is growth. Economic growth is not happening. Population is falling. The area is losing population faster than any other part of the country. And I welcome the Economic Development Task Force, presently chaired by Nick Ferguson, which is in place, and I welcome its emerging conclusions, which are about connectivity. And I want to make connectivity the centre of what I say today. Connectivity, digital and physical, is key to the healthy future of island communities. They must have improved mobile phone service. And the Scottish Government Innovation and Call is a good pointer forward, though companies have to contribute. They cannot ignore their island customers as they tend to do. Improved broadband is essential for island communities. Uh, last year there were 25 new undersea cables laid as part of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, British Telecom uh, project. And that was the, the largest number of undersea cables ever laid in a single summer. But it is a slow rollout that is leading to frustration. Community Broadband Scotland has certainly stepped in, and the Mull project that the Minister mentioned is of great significance. But there needs to be a tangible outcome so that people feel they're getting that service. People want it, and they want it quickly. And connectivity in services is vital. Mary Scanlon referred to that. Uh, Royal Mail's recent vault fast on sorting mail on Tyree and Mull was important because it showed that a bit of pressure from the islands could say to large national bodies, you shouldn't do things this way. But we need island proofing not just in government policies, but in every commercial enterprise too, and in all national bodies, recognizing the particular problems and issues in Ireland and responding accordingly, and innovating in matters such as transport and delivery. The discussion in this chamber last week about the possibility of ferry hubs for delivery is germane. But transport is also at the heart of this. I have a constituent who is sending me twice a day the link to the departures and arrival boards at the airport in Isla. And she's doing it because every single day and every single flight is delayed. Now, that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for any carrier to be doing that. And while I'm grateful for what the minister has said, that must stop. And if it is true that Logan Air is prioritising other services instead of its island services, then the minister should stamp down on that hard. The air travel is vital and so is ferry travel. Ferry travel is central to life in islands. And just as I represent more islands, I represent more ferry routes. I... Uh, we should recognise that RET is a major achievement. People of a certain political vintage, like perhaps Mr Gibson and myself, uh, were arguing for RET in the 1970s. It has been delivered, and it's been delivered by an SNP government, and I'm immensely proud of that. Now we need to move on. Now we need to move on and look at the issue of transport costs and freight costs. There's a, a review underway, and that is very important. 
Uh, presiding officer, uh, I represent a, a wonderful area. It has, unfortunately, a local authority that's trying to destroy it with the cuts that have been forward in the last week. What we need to do is to look at the right way to develop services in local areas. That comes from a variety of different levels of decision making. Sometimes the change will come from community ownership, as in GIA. Sometimes it will come from existing through structures such as local authorities, but also through bodies such as the Tobermory Harbour Association, which wants to have the powers of the Crown Estate. Its biggest barrier is the local authority that wants to cut its funding. And sometimes it comes through this chamber, looking at the islands as the jewel in the Scottish Crown, spread across the west and north of this country, recognising their special needs and going that extra mile to make sure we support the people who live in islands, the services in Ireland, the links to islands, so those islands grow and flourish. I'm proud of the things that this government is doing. It can always do a wee bit more. Many thanks. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, presiding officer, let me uh, draw members' attention to the entry in my members' interests. I'm president of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, a subject which I expect to cover in my contribution. I uh, was thinking about when I first went to an island. It appears to be been Easter uh, 1965 when I first went to Skye, and it's been my very great pleasure to have visited islands all across Scotland. And indeed, uh, we've talked a good deal about aviation. I find I've flown so far into 13 airports on islands, um, four of them my flying myself, the other ones commercially. Uh, so the islands are part of my heritage and part of my family's heritage. My grandfather uh, was appointed as a schoolmaster in Lewis in the 1880s. Uh, he was an Anglophone Scot married to an English lady. It wasn't the most obvious of appointments in what was actually a wholly Gaelic-speaking community. But then that is precisely uh, part of uh, the disrespect that was shown to island traditions that uh, the, the abolition of Gaelic was almost public policy in those days, and I regret my grandfather played a little uh, role in that. I think uh, Mike Russell may have missed a little trick. Um, we're talking about islands, and we're talking about island authorities, but there are also, of course, parts of mainland Scotland that are almost islands in terms of their accessibility, and I particularly think uh, of the Mullock Entire. And by contrast, of course, one almost could uh, suggest that Skye is no longer an island, now it's connected to the mainland. But I think let's pass on uh, from that. Now, I know that Dave Thompson's going to talk about air services to Skye and his contribution. I want to just talk a little bit about how we could change the regulatory regime to make air services cheaper, easier, and more pervasive. Um, first point, uh, one that I pursued when I was a minister but without very much success, is that we require commercial flights in the UK to be operated by twin-engined aircraft. Now, that's not the case in Finland, in France, in Greece, in Spain, uh, and in Norway, where single-engined aircraft can operate many of the thin routes. That reduces costs and increases frequency. Now, you might think, of course, as Lord King did when asked why does he always fly in a 747 whenever he can, because it's got four engines, he said, and they don't make any six-engine planes. But, of course, what is the reliability and accident record of single-engine planes compared to multi-engine? And the interesting thing is, in the United States, for single-engine turboprop planes, it's 1.99 accidents uh, per 100,000 flight hours. But for twin-engine planes, it's 2.37. In other words, 15% higher when you have more than one engine, because flying a multi-engine plane with one engine not working is more complex than dealing with the total failure of the one engine you've got. And fatalities, similarly, are greater in multi-engine light aircraft compared to heavy aircraft, uh, co compared to single engine. So I think we should look at the experience of others and continue to lobby the civil aviation authority in the UK government. Uh, secondly, uh, we, should, uh, we should also consider uh, whether uh, we have the right approach mechanisms. Now, this is a technical issue, but it actually matters. We're talking about reliability of air services in Scotland. The weather has got quite a lot to do with it. I was reading a, an incident report on a Logan Air flight uh, that was severely affected by icing. 
no injury, no pro the passengers may not have even been aware of it. But we have got weather that affects what goes on in Scotland. And one of the things that affects that is fog and low cloud at our airports. Well, in the UK, we have one that I'm aware of, airport that's now using modern GPS technology to allow aircraft to make approach. That happens to be Shoreham. In the United States, they have 1,800 airports now uh, where you can make your approach in single-engined aircraft using GPS. And I give as an example Provo in Utah, where the pilot's uh, uh, chart for that shows that you can descend using GPS to a cloud, through a cloud base of 200 feet. If you go to Wick, for example, in Scotland, where you do not have that facility, we're talking about 366 feet. So the cloud has to be higher. And of course, it's very cheap. You want to put an instrument landing system in, it costs you a million pounds put in GPS, it costs the airport almost nothing, it costs the operators quite modest amounts of money. It's time that the CEA and others allowed things to move on so that we can reduce costs and improve reliability simultaneously. Now, I know these are not necessarily within the gift of the minister, except insofar as he can lobby uh, others elsewhere. European authorities, not merely UK uh, authorities. Now, let me just close, uh, presiding officer, by touching on one thing that hasn't yet come up, and that is universal service, in particular for the delivery and collection of goods. Too many of our island communities, and indeed mainland communities that are relatively remote, are disadvantaged by excess delivery charges that commercial operators make. And I think it's for high time that that was tackled with, by legislation if necessary, if possible, but certainly by exposing these rip-off merchants for what they are, by seeking to persuade them that equity is required in this matter if we're going to support people in all the islands that uh, we live in, but in particular the islands that we're talking about today that are represented by the three island communities. A range of problems, but a range of opportunities as well. Presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call Margaret McDougall to be followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you, presiding officer. As a West of Scotland MSP, I have island communities within my region. Arran, with a population of 4,629, and the Cumbries, with a population of 1,280 as of 2011. I note that the government is looking to change electoral ward rules for populated islands. This is currently a hot topic on Arran, more so with the proposed boundary changes, and I will be keeping an eye on how this develops and will encourage those on Arran to respond to the consultation. Presiding officer, in my speech today, I'm going to highlight some of the difficulties faced by our islands, such as housing, transport and fuel poverty, with the added factor of being in remote and difficult to reach locations. The main focus of my speech will be housing, although I'll briefly touch on other areas. At a recent meeting of the cross-party group on housing, which I chair, Derek Logie, the Chief Executive of Rural Housing Scotland, gave an interesting presentation into some of the issues that are faced by those on our islands and in rural communities. Housing in these areas is traditionally more expensive and the average rural price is 15% higher than urban prices, with around 13.5% of houses in rural Scotland for social rent. And despite having 18.4% of the population, island and rural communities only receive 9% of government housing investment. This means that in many of these areas there is a real lack of not just social housing but affordable housing too and many local people are priced out of the market. Trying to solve this problem is no easy task. Building affordable rural housing is difficult and expensive and this problem is more apparent on islands where ferries have to be used to move construction materials and equipment, leading to higher costs. Irvine Housing Association experienced this issue while constructing 56 affordable homes in Lam Lash for North Ayrshire Council. These additional costs, slow construction rates, which harms both the local and national economy and causes supply and demand issues. 
To deal with the issues of demand and tackle insufficient social housing supply, Scottish Churches Housing Action established a charity called White Beam Homes. According to White Beam, local people on Arran are being priced out due to the high selling and rental costs. And while they welcome the lamb lash development, they fear it will not be enough to meet the current local demand. Given the lower investment per population share, I would encourage the government to look into this issue, identifying where demand isn't being met and outline a plan to deal with this issue. Fuel poverty is also a serious problem across our islands. Millport on Cumbria is in line with the rest of North Ayrshire, but is still too high, with around 29% of the population suffering from fuel poverty. While 40% of the population on Arran suffer from fuel poverty, according to Scottish Government figures. Arran is further away from the mainland, so fuel costs are higher. In addition, many of the houses are older and not as energy efficient. Regulatory standards for retrofitting privately rented homes could have helped tackle this issue, but unfortunately this wasn't included in the Scottish Government's recent Housing Act. In my view, not enough is being done to eradicate fuel poverty. It is a national scandal and we need to do more, not only to promote retrofitting, but we need to encourage people to switch service providers because islanders tend to have a loyalty to their power supplier, even when it could save them hundreds of pounds a year. Presiding officer, before I finish, I feel that I have to mention the current CalMAC situation. CalMAC provides a lifeline ferry service to Arn, Cumbria and many other islands across Scotland. This service may now be under threat due to the contract being put out to tender, a process which many of the opposite benches argued against last time, if you just let me finish, stating that tendering these lifeline services could lead to them deteriorating. Minister. Take your intervention. Well, will the member uh, appreciate that the timetables, the investment, the fares and the vessels themselves, irrespective of the legally required tendering process, will remain in public control and public ownership, and therefore there is no need to scaremonger about the ferry services to Arran. Well, I welcome the, the Minister's assurances, but, uh, you know, there is a lot of scepticism out there and the strong uh, protections that we need to have in place for the workforce. And, you know, will there be the protection for the workforce? Will there be no compulsory redundancies within these um, new contracts? In addition to this, can the Minister confirm what communication he has had with the European Commission on the tendering issue, given that the SNP MEP Alan Smith has said in the past that there were alternatives to the tendering process. Did you want to come in? Minister. Delighted to take a further um, opportunity to intervene on the member. Over the course of the summer, I met with the trade unions specifically on employment matters, and they are satisfied with the outcome of those uh, discussions, that they do feel that degree of protection that the member is seeking. Uh, and all the uh, questions around engagement with the European Union has shown that we have no choice but to undertake the procurement exercise that we are undertaking. But what we are doing is ensuring safety, ensuring the provision of services and also the continuity of service that everyone would expect. And if we hadn't undertaken this course of action, then yes, Europe may well have had to intervene and that would have put all the island ferry services at risk. So we have totally complied with all necessary legislation, engaged with Europe, and I'm very positive about the engagement with the trade unions, which has ensured protection for staff also. Yeah. Margaret McDougall, and you must start to conclude, Thank please. You. Uh, Bell, we'll wait and see what happens in the tendering issue. To conclude, there are many other issues I could have mentioned, such as access to broadband, which Mike Russell um, has spoken of, which unfortunately some areas in Arran still don't have. But due to time constraints, I 
don't have time to discuss that today. I feel the areas I have mentioned are not just important to the islands in my area, but across all the islands in Scotland, more so given the recent report showing that we need to double construction of affordable housing from 6,000 to 12,000 to meet demand. Fuel poverty is also a very serious issue across Scotland, but our island, island communities suffer the most. We need to do everything we can to drive down costs and provide energy efficient, affordable homes to our islands. Thank you, Thank you very much. I now call Dave Thompson to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I echo my colleagues in welcoming this important debate following the Scottish Government's launching of its consultation on a proposed Islands Bill on the back of last year's Our Islands, Our Future campaign. The bill proposes that island communities acquire additional powers and stronger representation in the Scottish Parliament and the creation of a national islands plan. As an ex-islander myself, having spent 10 years in Stornoway, I very much welcome the section on island proofing, which will ensure that the government will take into account the needs of the islands at the earliest possible stages of policy formulation. The proposed bill is a fantastic development, and especially so for my constituency of Skye, Lochaber and Badenoch, which includes many islands and remote coastal areas. In considering this proposed bill, I have reflected, particularly on my nearly five years as constituency MSP for Skye, Lochaber and Badenoch, and have concluded that there is an immensely strong case for the West Highlands and Islands, from Uig in Skye to Glencoe in Lochaber, to have its own local authority and its own Scottish parliamentary constituency. Mike Russell is right to complain that this debate has been dominated by Orkney, Shetland and Nahelen and Anyar, which are very worthy island groupings and authorities. But they are very little different to Sky Lochalsh and Lochaber in terms of the challenges they face. And I give notice to the Minister that I am starting a campaign today to get such recognition for Sky Lochalsh and Lochaber. In this, I have the support of Ian Blackford, MP, for Ross Sky and Lochaber, and will work closely with him uh, to convince the Minister and bring this to fruition. The electorate of Sky Lochalsh and Lochaber is around 27,000, compared to around 22,000 in Nahelen and Nyer, 18,000 in Shetland, and 17,000 in Orkney. Sky Lochalsh and Lochaber has islands and remote mainland communities akin to islands and suffers from all the problems of connectivity that the three main island groups do. The roads are often risible, the telecoms are terrible, and the air services are absolutely non-existent. I hope the Minister will seriously consider my proposal, and I will respond formally to the consultation so he can do so, and I will also write to him to ask for a meeting to pursue the matter. Of course, island communities like these in Sky Lochalsh and Lochaber need ferries. And since the Scottish Government came to power in 2007, it has invested significantly to support lifeline ferry services, including the commissioning of new vessels and harbour infrastructure. A record 1,000 million has been invested, and with the road equivalent tariff now fully rolled out, this will mean a reduction in the cost of ferry travel for all passengers, coaches and small commercial vehicles to all of Scotland's islands. And I also very much welcome the ferry fare freeze for 2016-17. All of this on top of the recent excellent news from Calmark that new direct daily return sailings will be put on between Loch Boysdale in South Uist and Malig in my constituency, as well as an increase in sailings between Malig and Armadale and Skye. Although the increase in sailings between Malig and Armadale is to be welcomed, I would caution the Minister that total capacity must also be maintained and even increased. These improvements uh, that I have mentioned exemplify clearly 
uh, that the Scottish Government is committed to essential ferry services for our island communities that rely on them, ensuring that our islands remain attractive and accessible to visitors. Of course, in the context of devolution for the islands, it is not just about essential ferry services, but also air services. As I said earlier, our air services to Sky, Lochalsh and Lochaber are absolutely non-existent. But there is hope on the horizon. The Fly Sky campaign group have been promoting the case for the restoration of passenger air links to the island of Skye for a number of years, and there is no doubt that the reintroduction of air links from Skye to the central belt would benefit the economy of Skye and Lochalsh and would bring it into line with other regions of similar populations to Skye, who already have a range of transport options. Take Wick, for example. It is on the mainland and is around the same distance from Edinburgh as, as Skye, but it also has a well-used passenger airport. So all we're talking about is equity. The capital cost of such a service would be no more than £2.8 million, and it is estimated that such a service would result in an additional annual spend in the local economy of around 300000 and would create numerous jobs. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would welcome support from the government on this, as I believe a fully functioning air service to Sky is long overdue. The bill is an important opportunity for everyone to help shape a fairer and more prosperous future for our islands and help to shape important island-specific legislation, which will have a significant impact on the lives of islanders for years to come. This is an opportunity we, close, we should please. not miss not only to consolidate island groups like Orkney, Shetland and Nahalan and, and Year, but also to create a new peripheral and island local authority and parliamentary constituency in the West Highlands. You must from close, and please. Sky, just finishing, presiding officer, to Glencoe and Lochaber, which would be a huge step forward for the people of Sky, Lochalsh and Lochaber. Many thanks. Uh, now clock is running down. Uh, up to six minutes, please. Call on Angus Macdonald to be followed by Lewis Macdonald. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Now, the more observant uh, members in the Chamber this afternoon will be aware that there are no islands in my Falkirk East constituency, uh, apart perhaps from a roundabout that Falkirk Council has designed to look like a Hebridean island, uh, which I have to admit doesn't resemble any Hebridean island that I've ever visited. And needless to say, the locals have christened it Tracy Island or Fantasy Island. Uh, and if you know the workings of Falkirk Council, you'll understand why. <laughs> uh, however, as a born and bred Lyosach, or someone hailing from the Isle of Lewis, for those unfortunate enough not to have any Gaelic, uh, I couldn't resist contributing to today's debate. At the outset, can I say how pleased I was to see the Islands Bill consultation being announced and its concentration on equality and empowerment for our island communities is very welcome indeed. Proposals for additional power, stronger representation and the creation of a National Islands Plan are all welcome steps in the right direction and I hope islanders in uh, the Northern Isles and the Western Isles seize this tremendous opportunity. Hailing from the Isle of Lewis and having had my own business and helped run family businesses on the island, I am acutely aware of the challenges island communities have faced in the past and currently face. And of course, as part of our evidence-taking sessions on the Land Reform Bill, our Raki Committee has visited uh, islands as diverse as Orkney, Isla, Jura and Skye. And over and above the evidence we took on land reform, we also heard of major challenges facing each and every island we visited at first hand. On Orkney, we visited in early summer when farmers were having to consider selling off their breeding stock because there, were, uh, there was no grass due to the prolonged period of exceptional weather. Uh, but it's not just Orkney, of course. Most of our islands have been affected by poor weather this year. However, the impact on Orkney farmers and crofters has been particularly harsh. Cattle have been sold early. The quantity and quality of silage is poor, and it is estimated that the harvest is at least 30 per cent back on last year. The cost of bringing straw to Orkney, or Lewis indeed, uh, is substantial, with an average load costing between £2,000 and £2,500, £2, of which the haulage costs are more than half. And in a normal year, I believe around 30 loads are brought into Orkney uh, of straw, but this year there have been over 220. 
There are, of course, many challenges to the agricultural sector on the islands. However, there are many, many positives too. Uh, but before I go on to the positives, uh, I too must uh, highlight uh, an issue which has already been raised uh, this afternoon in the Chamber uh, and is becoming a more prominent issue, and one which unfortunately frustrated members of the Raki Committee uh, experienced uh, recently, and that is what is becoming a far too regular delay on Logan Air and Flybe flights, with uh, flight delays of two to three hours to and from the islands becoming increasingly commonplace. Uh, and I am reliably informed by that bastion of local democracy, the West Highland Free Press, that the island's minister himself was delayed en route to Stornoway last week when heading up to announce the launch of the consultation on the bill. <laughs> so I am um, glad to hear uh, the minister's uh, statement earlier on uh, in his introduction that action is being taken to address reliability and hopefully islanders will see a return to better air services in the near future. Now, these are just two examples of the myriad of challenges currently being faced by island islanders. However, hopefully, if the further powers proposed for the islands are approved, then some of these challenges can be addressed and dealt with at a local level, rather than calling on the Scottish Government to intervene at every turn. Since the launch of Our Islands, Our Future campaign in 2013, there has been a welcome positive working partnership formed between the Scottish Government and the Islands Councils, to address some of the challenges islands face, and it will be proof positive that joint working can pay off to the benefit of local communities. In addition, the creation of an islands minister, uh, when the first minister took up her office, sends the strongest signal possible to island communities that the Scottish Government takes the future of Scotland's island communities extremely seriously. One of the most important aspects of the consultation, President Officer, is the section on island proofing. Uh, the measures the Government could take to ensure the special circumstances of the islands are always taken into account during the early stages of policy development. And the consultation also seeks views on what additional powers should be devolved to the islands' councils to benefit the islands and recognise their special status. Now, there is also a proposal which I welcome to statutorily uh, protect uh, Nahelen and the near Scottish Parliament constituency boundary. And that, I have to say, uh, President Officer, is a no-brainer, and I hope the feedback to the consultation will agree with that proposal 100 per cent. I vaguely remember in my younger days the crazy situation where Lewis was in the Rosshire County Council area and Harris was in the Invernessshire County Council boundary. It was a ludicrous situation, and I believe the best thing that happened to the Western Isles was the creation of a unitary local authority covering the whole of the Outer Hebrides. I would therefore wholeheartedly agree that the parliamentary boundary should be protected in an Act of Parliament. So, in closing, President Officer, I welcome each and every proposal in the consultation and I look forward to the feedback from it. This is an opportunity for island communities to secure additional powers for themselves and flourish, and I hope they grab it with both hands. Thank you. Many thanks. Now, call on Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you very much. Island communities are special. The very existence of living communities of men, women and children in so many Atlantic islands is a tribute to the toughness and tenacity of past generations. Sustaining those communities into the future is the responsibility of the present generation, not just in those islands, but across the whole of this island as well. And today's debate is about how that is to be done, and it is a subject close to my heart. I was born in the Isle of Lewis. My father was born in North Lewis. His father was born in Bernerai. My mother was evacuated to the Isle of Arran during the war. My wife's mother comes from Shetland, and my wife's father's family came from Orkney. So I have lived in or visited many of Scotland's inhabited islands, and quite a few of those which are inhabited no longer. I know that islanders view the world in a very distinctive way. And like many people from island cultures, I attach uh, great importance to historical context. Understanding the long view is important to getting policy right for the future. Islands today are disadvantaged by geography. The sea marks the limit of island communities. Most journeys today are journeys by land. Historically, it was very different. Communities were linked, not separated by the sea. It was easier to travel along coastlines than across country. So Orkney was at the crossroads of the North Atlantic world. Shetland was strategic, strategically placed. The Lordship of the Isles formed a bridge between the Scottish and Irish Gaeltachts and was a principality in its own right. 
It is wrong to think of Scotland's islands as intrinsically remote or isolated or less important than Scotland's mainland. If we recognise our islands as of equal importance, we can design policy accordingly. When I was a boy, Lewis and Harris were divided not just by the steep climb up and down the Clisham uh, or by the sea locks on either side, but also by a line on the map. As Angus MacDonald said, Lewis was in the county of Ross and Cromarty, Harris was in Invernessshire, and both islands felt that they were governed remotely by mainland councils far away. The creation of Corley and Island Shear was one of the great success stories of local government reorganisation in 1973. For the first time in centuries, political decisions at a local level were taken in the islands themselves, not on the east coast of the Scottish mainland. And that was a truly revolutionary change. Bringing power home to the islands released tremendous energy and creativity from completing the chain of causeways joining so many islands together to the revival of pride in the Gaelic language and culture. Another revolution was accomplished in the northeastern quarter of Lewis as long ago as the 1920s, when the people of the parish of Stornoway acquired ownership of the land. It is no coincidence that the one Hebridean community to enjoy the benefits of community ownership for most of the 20th century has also been the community most successful in retaining its population. It is no wonder that so many other Highland and Island communities have wanted to follow suit. So devolving both political and economic power strengthens and sustains island communities. That is the lesson of the Stornoway Trust and the lesson of Corn and Island Shear. Much the same conclusions can be drawn from the recent history of Orkney and of Shetland. In the context of today's debate, the principle of subsidiarity offers the political power the islands need. Protecting the parliamentary representation of the Western Isles can be part of that. Economic power can come from the double devolution of the assets, the economic assets of the Crown Estate, to give islands councils control of the seabed and of the foreshore where they do not have that already. But as Labour's amendment suggests, effective empowerment of island communities does not stop there. When I was Transport Minister in Scotland's devolved government, we worked night and day to protect Clyde and Hebrides ferry services from privatisation, and we succeeded. European Union rules were much the same then as they are now, so it is deeply disappointing that the present Scottish Government has failed to achieve the same outcome today. There is little point in talking about community empowerment, then leasing out the right to provide lifeline transport services to our private profit-making company, of course. Mr Derek Mackay. Is the member seriously suggesting that the Labour Party's position is that we shouldn't have undertaken the procurement exercise, incurred the wrath of Europe and potentially have put all those services in jeopardy because we failed to comply with what we have established as a clearly necessary legal process? Yes, Mr Donald. Almac has been in public ownership since 1948 and we have been in the European Union since 1973. No previous government has allowed itself to be boxed into a position or chosen to take a policy decision to, to privatise the services. If this government does that, then it will be responsible for making that choice. But because, in my view, only by sustaining a public sector provider, a, a provider within the public sector, can people in the islands hope to have any direct influence on their single most strategic public service. Ministers should therefore give that objective the highest priority. And of course, Stuart Stevenson was right to highlight the issue of discriminatory charges for parcel deliveries to Highland and Island communities, as a number of us did during a members' business debate a couple of weeks ago. Many island communities face very high fuel prices and suffer exceptionally severe fuel poverty. They could more than solve these problems if they were able to realise the full potential of energy from their own resources of wind, wave and tide. Enhancing the electricity transmission and distribution networks to enable island generators to produce heat and power cheaply for local consumption and to sell power to the grid would make a major contribution to the economies of many of our islands and help to tackle fuel poverty. So in developing an island strategy, the Scottish Government should assess what more it can do to support investment and development by communities and local councils in renewable energy projects, and what can usefully be included in the island's bill to help make it happen. If we address those issues of lifeline services and economic opportunities, we can go beyond good intentions and institutional reform and address the issues that matter most if we are to deliver a sustainable future for Scotland's islands. Thanks so much. Now, Colin Rob Gibson to be followed by Jean Urquhart. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, much has been said about uh, the issues of connectivity, fuel poverty, etc. already. Uh, I think it would be a good idea for us to look at some of the things that have worked over the length of this Parliament and some that have not. Uh, and during the first uh, four years of uh, this Parliament, there was a land reform proposals that allowed for a lot of community buyouts. And indeed, it's the communities in the Western Isles in particular that have most benefited from this. Uh, it links to that uh, example that uh, people on the mainland need to learn that lesson a good deal stronger than they have. But uh, it doesn't make it easier for communities in the Western Isles if they can't have links to the mainland, the connectivity that's required from the transmission system. Now, we have heard uh, at least some praise for the fact that this government has been doing its very best to make sure that, that link, these links can be made. And when you think about it, uh, there are possibilities uh, for the export of electricity from community-owned projects that communities are raising directly income that doesn't rely on state handouts or the local government settlement. And it is the area in which they can perhaps add most value to the money they have to spend in those areas. We can already see in South Uist the income from uh, the renewables that they have and in Gia and so on. We can see that when people control the electricity, then there's an opportunity to use it. Now, one of the things I think with ferries that should be talked about in terms of uh, their development is a greater ability to actually store electricity or to use the electricity produced in the islands to power the new ferries in the next generation. Now, we've got small ones at the moment, uh, to Rassi, etc., that are partly electric. We've got to move to a situation where we can actually have more of the ferries, for example, in Orkney's Northern and Southern Isles, which Liam MacArthur wants to speak about just now. Very grateful to Rob Gibson um, for taking an intervention. Um, he'll be aware, perhaps, of the Surf and Turf um, project in uh, Orkney, which is looking very much at that issue. I mean, it's at its early stages, but I think it's a step along the way in terms of the hydrogen economy and, and being smarter about the way in which we use those natural resources to provide the lifeline services, in this case, ferry services. Rob Gibson. I am, and I'm also aware of the fact that there needs to be charging points, for example, uh, at the pier on the mainland before you reach Rousey. And that was one of the things we noticed in our visit to Orkney. And talking about our visit to Orkney, uh, the development director, I think he is, Paul Maxton, gave evidence to our committee and suggested that at that time they hadn't any uh, proposals to actually devolve the Crown Estate beyond the council. But thanks to the discussions in Our Islands, Our Future, they were beginning to change their mind about that. And of course, in the Smith Commission, it suggests that it's not just Orkney, Shetland, and Nahilan and Anshir, but other areas who seek such responsibilities who should be given those. And I think when it comes to uh, the devolution to this parliament, it's got to make sure that that can happen, not just to harbour boards, but to smaller islands so that they can control the seas round about them. And in that respect, also, I think it's important to recognise that um, we've had the several order around Shetland, which has been an important 10-year experiment in local management of the inshore waters. Perhaps we haven't talked much about fishing. There's a need for that kind of democratic control, but also some assessment. I've mentioned this before, I think, but I believe it's something which can add to the value of living in these islands and make many more incomes for people there. Now, in terms of the devolution of the Crown Estate, I should also warn that it's necessary to keep the skills together that have been built up in the Crown Estate for renewables development. And in the evidence received in the Rural Affairs Committee, it's come to us that the group of people who do that job need to be able to empower islands, but will be based probably in the mainland somewhere and maybe a part of government in future. And that's why what's discussed in this parliament about how we actually structure uh, the Crown Estate in future is something that involves both the mainland and the islands. Now, there's a degree of amnesia, you know, uh, amongst Labour and Liberal speakers today. You know, decentralisation of more power to the islands was not being discussed fully in the first eight years of this parliament. And I'm glad to say that the SNP government has taken these forward. 
And I certainly think that it's important to recognise that whilst land reform was proposed, there weren't uh, situations where there was going to be a change in the tax structure. We have a tax commission now. It should be possible, hopefully, for us to see next year the means to raise more of our taxes at local level. And if we get the land reform uh, proposals correct, it may be that we may be able to tax some ways of large landowners who at the present time don't pay any tax at all, except for their council tax. And I think that if there was more of that being able to be taken in, in the land that's not owned by communities, that would be a, an added bonus for local authorities. Now, I represent close, several islands, the Crowland Islands in the middle of a torpedo range, ILU, uh, uh, Brunyard, which used to have a test range for anthrax, the Summer Isles, which people can't live in because the sea's too choppy, San Handa, which is a, um, a bird sanctuary, Garvey Island, which is uh, bombed regularly by the MOD, uh, Elan and Ron and Stroma, which were evacuated. And so even in the small islands around my constituency, there's a need to have the possibility that people could use them better and indeed live on them in future. So this debate is very useful and it's not just about the big councils of the three that we've talked about earlier. Many thanks. Now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I too welcome this debate and very much welcome the consultation on the islands. I'm delighted that, the, that we do have a Minister for the Islands in Derek Mackay. And I know that so far he has done, I think, a, a remarkably good job. A lot of the obvious uh, issues have been covered, presiding officer, in terms of transportation and uh, accessibility and so on uh, of the of all of the island, of the archipelagos and the, the small islands of Argyle and small islands of the Highland Council local authority areas. And one of the issues has been uh, the provision of broadband and, and superfast broadband and that kind of access. And I, I would like to put um, a slightly different, have a different take on that minister. And that is one where we are very keen to always to talk about how open this parliament is and how accessible and that we want clarity of government and so on. But it seems to me that there's a real opportunity here to engage with all of these people on the, on the islands by using technology. But this parliament is the stumbling block in many cases. Through the University of the Highlands and Islands, there is a fantastic network of video conferencing across the islands and across main, mainland Highland. The uh, NHS Highland 2 has very good communication and, and there are a number. Now it's, it's quite commonplace for uh, doctors or specialists, consultants to consult using uh, video conferencing, but not so for parliamentary business. And although people can, of course, tune into the parliamentary stations and so on. We have a number, I think about 100 cross-party groups on specialist issues, many of which are relevant to people living in the islands. And I think there is a case to be made now where we can uh, surely attract their attention. Now, certainly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, just to help the member, she may be aware that now the technology that's in our meeting rooms can be used for Skype teleconferencing precisely for cross-party groups and was introduced for that purpose. Jean Urquhart. I'm absolutely aware of all of the rooms that have any upgrade on, on the uh, IT systems and would have to say to Mr Stevenson that one person being able to Skype in is restrictive in terms of any other visual presentation that may be, may be made and there are only a few rooms that have that, that facility, not all the, the rooms that are used uh, by uh, cross-party groups. The, uh, however, I'm pleased that, that I know that a number of people within the Parliament do know about this, but I, I think it would, it would be a, an enormous uh, gesture too that we start to engage with more of the people from, from rural highlands and islands uh, in this way. I do believe that the resurgence of political interest has come about because of the referendum. 
I think that without the referendum, I doubt there would have been an Our Islands, Our Future at all. And in my own experience, uh, in a very privileged position to represent all of the islands with the exception of Arran, um, I do know that that kind of political debate was definitely as a, as a result of the kind of discussions that were going on around a referendum. And I, don't, I think we are fools if we don't recognise that, all of us. The, um, the re-politicisation of, of, of councils, if you like, and I, while I hear the case that's being made for devolved powers in every case, uh, and centralisation being used, I think, or abused uh, as, as some kind of stick to beat the Scottish Government with. When it comes, there are so many examples over the last four and a half years that I've been involved in the islands, and that is uh, that has to do with the Scottish Government policy actually being preferred above local government. And so with great caution, I say on behalf of all of the people who live on the islands, that when it came to Scottish Government education policy to keep small schools open, there is no doubt where they turned to for help and got it. So I think, while I absolutely support everything that's here, I hope the consultation, I will certainly encourage people to respond to that, uh, that there are many issues uh, that, that can be addressed through that. I also say that, that government policy and party policy, given that there's an election next year, will still be to the fore in all of these, in many of these issues, and people should pay attention to that. And finally, Minister, I would just like to say that you mentioned very early on in your opening uh, speech that the islands had a very distinct culture and language and so on. And I would just ask that whoever is in government in Scotland, that we start actually to try and encourage, whether it's through school trips or sports trips, cultural groups, to engage with the whole of Scotland, that just how special the island communities are, and that we shouldn't deny any child growing up in this country the, the, the possibility of at least once, possibly twice, close, in their please. school, in their education, that they have, have a chance to visit the islands on many of the wonderful ferries that we have. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Michael McMahon. Okay. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I welcome the opportunity to take part in this afternoon's debate. Uh, and like so many other speakers know, I'm not an islander, although I've had the privilege of visiting islands on many occasions and, in fact, for many different reasons. Um, uh, when I was uh, working for Guide Dogs, I had the, the great privilege of, of uh, wor uh, working in Shetland, Orkney, and indeed uh, in Mull, and uh, in one or two other islands where uh, at that time I was assessing people for um, Guide Dogs. And can I say uh, that we still have good, uh, I, I think we still have Guide Dogs in, in most of these islands that I've just mentioned. But my other visitations to islands were generally for pleasure and leisure when I was sailing and can I say, uh, when uh, Mr McIntosh was talking about the sort of fair weather aspect of going to the islands, can I say, as a sailor visiting many of these islands uh, in a Force 9, it was great to get some shelter, uh, and that was during the summer. Um, but, presiding officer, one of the things the minister said at the very outset was what this consultation is about. It's about empowering the people within the islands. It's giving them a voice. It's giving them a voice so that they, presiding officer, they decide. They make the decisions. They shape the future of what is coming forward. It's not coming from government. It's not coming from Mr Mackay. And I'm sure Mr Mackay himself would welcome the opportunity for people to have their say. And perhaps one of the challenges for our minister, presiding officer, is perhaps to maybe visit the 93 inhabited islands within uh, uh, his portfolio. I'm not quite sure how many the minister has managed to get to so far, but 93 is certainly a high target. Maybe it's uh, similar to those who actually uh, climb on Monroe's and he can become an island bagger as opposed to a Monroe bagger. But, presiding officer, 
when I was listening to some of the challenges that they have in the islands, and I take on board exactly what to Michael uh, Russell was saying, and I was slightly surprised that Michael Russell, in his contribution presiding officer, didn't actually mention rural schools and what this government has done for rural schools in trying to ensure that rural schools do not close under the auspices of this government. And I think there was a certain Michael Russell had something to do with that particular uh, aspect of legislation uh, uh, in this uh, parliament, presiding officer. So I was surprised that uh, he didn't actually uh, put a, a, a light on himself during his contribution. But when I was listening to many of the contributions, it did remind me of my own constituency, especially in some of the remote and rural aspects of my own constituency, where we have the same, same sort of issues regarding connectivity, whether that be the transport or whether that be to do with digital connectivity. And one of the things I welcome the minister in his contribution was when he was talking about the improvement within the mobile phone connectivity or indeed the broadband connectivity for the islands and to ensure that people can be connected. I'm sincerely hoping that that same commitment can come to some of our remote and rural uh, parts of Scotland, which don't enjoy maybe the connectivity that maybe some of the islands are enjoying now, presenting officer. But one of the things this connectivity does do, it does give our islanders hopefully more connection with our NHS because that digital connectivity does prevent people maybe having to take the flights or take the ferries perhaps into Aberdeen because the consultations can be done digitally and quite often even just moving around the different islands to go to the hospital for a consultation the, the connectivity providing it's there and providing it, it, it can it, the, the, the patient and the consultant or the doctor can have that conversation. And this is something I think is the crux of where we're at, presiding officer. It is the conversation. And whether that be health, whether that be social care, it is the conversation. And I believe that is what the, the, islands are being given, the, the islanders are being given the chance during this consultation. But I can just say to the minister, when we're asking people to enter into a consultation process, we must ensure that they have the ability to do so. So although I've mentioned the broadband and the mobile connectivity, we must ensure that people are aware that that communication is out there. And people who are not connected or who don't use that particular type of connectivity also have the opportunity to have their voice heard. It's incredibly important, presiding officer, that we do listen. And I believe this is a government that does listen. And despite the fact that I heard Mr. MacArthur saying all the things that wasn't said by the minister, he did say at least he is glad it is Derek Mackay that is taking it forward. Because he seems to entrust Derek Mackay with the fact that I hope he is a listening minister. And I believe he is a listening minister. And, I was surely sh and I'm sure he heard the plea of David Thompson, my colleague, for the airport on Sky. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thanks very much. I now call on Michael McMahon, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As many uh, speakers this afternoon have mentioned, our island communities are well recognised as a special part of Scotland. They make a huge contribution to the economy of our country because their natural beauty causes them to be of major benefit to our domestic tourist industry. When it comes to holiday options, I am quite partial to a staycation because I find the natural assets of Scotland's breathtaking landscape hard to resist. Indeed, 30 years ago, my honeymoon was spent touring the Highlands and Islands. But going there as a tourist rather than a politician may have blinded my visits to the Scottish Islands somewhat. And it was only recently when I went to Arran as a member of the Finance Committee that the scales fell from my eyes in terms of appreciating the practical problems facing island communities and businesses. Now, I'm as guilty as anyone who, when we choose holiday destinations to get away from the everyday routines and tell ourselves that we're looking to find peace and quiet, we always seem to check right away whether we have a good signal on our phone or whether we have Wi-Fi access when we arrive at our destination. Now, I can and do switch off when I'm on holiday, but I have to confess that knowing that I can be contacted if necessary or that I can keep an eye on what's happening in the wider world, I still find very reassuring. 
And that's how I felt this year on my summer vacation in Tenerife. There I was, stuck out in the Atlantic Ocean, in a quiet holiday resort with a slow-paced local culture. The hurly-burly of urban Lanarkshire left thousands of miles behind. And how good it was to know, though, that I had Wi-Fi access and a strong telephone signal available at all times that I was there. But one day on holiday, it occurred to me that that was a stark contrast to that visit I had been on with the committee colleagues some months earlier on Arran. There we were, barely a few miles off the mainland, the west coast always in sight and yet totally cut off from the internet and seldom in a position to make a phone call due to the lack of a strong signal. The many challenges this causes to people on the island was repeatedly driven home to us as we took evidence from the community representatives, business leaders, educationalists and others. It really is hard to comprehend having to be told that broadband connection on the island is almost primitive in comparison to that which people take for granted only a few miles away across the Firth of Clyde. It's barely believable that in the modern high-tech communication era, when we can receive signals and images from NASA missions on Mars and even as they leave our galaxy on their way uh, through the, the rest of the universe, that on Aaron the broadband cables are regularly broken by workers trimming the hedges because the cable companies didn't bury the lines underground as they do elsewhere, but merely laid them on top of the hedgerows that run along the sides of the roads around the island. And to hear business people telling us that their supplies are regularly delayed because they cannot get internet downloads for days on end is hardly credible in this day and age. The people that we heard from quite understandably were frustrated, if not downright angry. But what struck me, though, was that in recognising that it falls to government to ensure that such island communities are equipped to deal with issues like connectivity, the strength of feeling conveyed to us was aimed most at recognising that empowering local democracy was felt to be the best way for the community to realise their full potential rather than rely on the government. And that's why I completely support the work of our islands, our future campaign. In recent years, they made a strong case for empowering our island communities to address the problems their communities face. And I'll be very interested, therefore, to see whether the much-anticipated Islands Bill will meet the island communities' expectations. We really must commit this Parliament to use the powers that we're going to receive through the, the Smith uh, Commission changes to devolve more power to our island communities. That's what they demanded when I was on Arran. They want to be given the, the power as a local community to make decisions for themselves in a way that reflects the, the uniqueness of those island communities. And as a lifelong Lanarkshire man looking on from the, inside, from the outside, I can see no valid reason why that should not be the case. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Tavish Scott as we move to closing speeches. Mr Scott. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Alex Salmon used to attack me in, in leaders' debates in the past for saying that self-determination uh, didn't begin and end in Edinburgh. And the Minister's right. Islands now have options. I think they've had options for a long time. But by gosh, they've certainly got options now. There are some in my part of the world who'd actually quite like to go back to being ruled by Norway. But I think that's maybe a little bit extreme, although at times I can well understand it. Uh, but what uh, did come across to me when Liam MacArthur and I were both in Jersey this summer um, supporting our uh, Team Orkney and Team Shetlands in the NatWest Island Games in a discussion with the Chief Minister of uh, Jersey was just the options that are available to islands who think about their future. And in that, I'm very grateful to the Minister for uh, starting this uh, process. I'm not quite sure where this finishes, um, but that in itself is a good thing. Now, we sent our biggest ever team to Jersey. We won more medals than we've ever won before in what was just a fantastic week of sporting uh, excellence. But what really got, came across to me in that, meeting uh, ministerial uh, and parliamentary friends from across islands, from across the world, uh, was the camaraderie of all of us who shared the same uh, broad spread uh, issues and our desire to find the best solutions to those problems. Uh, I thought about that the other night when I was in the Vaux Hall in the north of Shetland listening to Ross and Ryan Cooper play fiddle and uh, guitar in, in only the way that they can. It seems to me that sport and music in particular are two of the enshrining attributes of much of Ireland life. And in that, I hope the Minister might add his uh, political pressure to those of his colleagues uh, as we argue for some financial assistance for our sporting teams. Who
who can then take part in competitions on the Scottish mainland and get to the same level as those who have now represented, such as Andrew Strachan, who have now represented Scotland, Team Scotland, in the Commonwealth Games and the so successful Glasgow Games of the other year. Uh, I also want to recognise uh, the role that Derek Mackay has uh, played, both as, as a minister who, who understands uh, that constituency MSPs are just doing their jobs, and I respect him uh, for that. I'm just not quite going to take the fact that he's the first Islands Minister. Ken McIntosh and I uh, well knew Alistair Morrison, and my recollection in, under the Donald Jewell administration is that we had an Islands Minister uh, then. And I seem to remember the SNP and Finnis uh, welcomed that. Uh, certainly Alistair and Derek Mackay are probably two very different characters, but the less said about that, probably the better. Uh, but the, this is now a debate, I suspect, not just about that big picture of what could happen in the future, presiding officer, but also about island proofing. Because I think as a number of colleagues, Liam McArthur and others have argued, for those of us who do, do live in the islands, who do argue for uh, sensible and constructive change that helps uh, the people that we are in this parliament to serve, then we will certainly attach that test to the government's proposals and government's actions. And it's the actions that matter most, particularly, if I may say so, in the run-up to an election, when everything is seen through the prism of electoral uh, politics. So I strongly welcome the Minister's announcement today, both on the ferry fare freeze and on the air discount scheme increase, although I'd rather he'd also increase the eligibility of ADS back to what it was before when Stuart Stevenson very sensibly continued the policy of the previous administration. That was a good policy Stuart Stevenson continued with and I'd encourage Mr Mackay to, uh, to go back to the policy that his own colleague had at that time. And on ferries, uh, while um, the freeze is welcome, people in Orkney and Shetland have noticed, and believe me they have noticed, that this government have spent money, money and more money on reducing fares on the, in the Clyde and the Hebrides rather than in my part and Liam Mackay as part of the world. Could I also just uh, reflect on, uh, as only Mike Russell can, his assertion that RET has been fully delivered. Well, I would hate to think how Mike Russell would define what the post office delivers these days if that's his definition of the full delivery of RET. Uh, I have probably asked for this. Mike Russell. <laughs> well, you may not have asked for it, but you're going to get it. The reality was that the commitment that the government entered into was to deliver RET in the Hebrides and Western Isles services and the Clyde services uh, by the end of this Parliament. That is and has been delivered. The final part of it will be in Mull later this month. Therefore, it has been delivered. Travis Scott. Some, something about commercial vehicles comes to mind, but uh, there we are. Well, I'll leave uh, Mr Russell to argue that with his own minister. I'm sure he's more than able uh, to do that. Um, the... Uh, essence of the other issues that I think confront islands at this time are around uh, and, and in the context of island proofing are as Liam MacArthur has rightly argued around such issues as the attainment fund. Um, I spoke to teachers this weekend. Uh, no constituency member could not but listen to the arguments that they are making in respect of how helpful that fund would be. I think the attainment funds are a really good thing for a government to do, but it should apply that right across the country and to all local authorities, including to those in the islands. Uh, and similarly on health funding, it's the government's own formula that is underfunding by their own formula. Uh, for example, NHS Shetland to the tune of 900,000 pounds a year. So if you're going to island proof, you've got island proof right across uh, the board. Now, many colleagues have mentioned this afternoon broadband, and on that, um, we, I suspect we share a common desire um, over the policy objective. But I and others have argued for some time that the policy, if I may say so, is the wrong way around. We should start, should we not, with the hardest to reach areas, concentrating then on the centres of population. And that contract needs a jig, needs to change, and Community Broadband Scotland that Mary Scanlon and others mentioned needs more support to do exactly that. Two other areas where the Minister could make a difference in his, uh, in his role, and that is, uh, in terms of the islands, is on, as Rob Gibson mentioned, the uh, seafood industry, which hasn't had a lot of attention this afternoon. It's worth £351 million to the Shetland economy, yet that discard ban for our whitefish industry is without doubt challenging, as is the introduction of the new cap 
uh, for agriculture right across the constituencies and areas that we all uh, represent. I am very concerned that the way in which his government are implementing their reclassification of land is causing some very significant concerns for crofters and farmers in those areas. Can I finish, presiding officer, with one point about the Crown Estate? It's pretty simple here, really. What we said in paragraph 33, and Rob Gibson had this right, what we had said in paragraph 33 of the Smith Commission report is responsibility for the management of the, those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas. The full responsibility, presiding officer, not the revenues, the full responsibility. John Swinney signed up to this. I hope his government will too. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnson. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I feel something of a fraud standing up here to speak in a debate about islands. <laughs> the, however, I do have to say that my colleague Jamie McGregor would have been here had he not been in Brussels returning today, representing the interests of his constituents in the Highlands and Islands. I have visited some of Scotland's islands, but I am a long way short of bagging the full 93. But it is enough to know that our island communities are vibrant, they are economically successful, and of course they are culturally one of the stars uh, in Scotland's uh, firmament. For that reason, I think we have to praise successive governments over many years for the work that has been done to secure the viability of Scotland's island communities. And it's only fair that this government and this parliament should find itself discussing today ways in which we can actually improve that going forward. Now, it has to be said that it is the intention of the Conservatives today to vote for the amendments and for the government motion, regardless of whether it is amended. But there have been one or two times during the course of this debate when the consensual views have be given way to a more confrontational approach. And I think my colleague Mary Scanlon has already, already made it quite clear to Mike McKenzie that he came very close to tipping her over the balance. <laughs> However, we will, we will work together today to ensure that this motion passes. However, there have been inter some interesting key points in this debate. And I'd like first to touch on the issue of ferry services. I am delighted that the government have taken steps to introduce the uh, road equivalent tariff, although uh, the fact that that is not available to commercial vehicles does cause some concern uh, and some impact on prices in some of our islands. I am delighted to hear that there will be a price freeze carried over to next year because that will give the predictability and the continuity to those who use our ferries uh, who may have been concerned about the impact of potential price rises. But the main issue that has been raised during the course of this debate regarding ferry services is the accusation, which I find hard to understand but it comes regularly from the Labour Party, that this government is somehow on the verge of privatising ferry services to the Western Isles. I would it was true, but yet they have failed to deliver what can be delivered in ferry services if they embrace the concept of competitive tendering and did it in a way that will reduce costs. We need to get every penny's worth of value from the money that we use to support ferry services. And we need to ensure that both the taxpayer and the fair payer gets value for money while we have the best service as possible. Now, I will hold up as an example the privately run, ferry, unsubsidised ferry services that run on the Clyde and on the Pentland Firth today. The Pentland Firth service in particular, uh, la, uh, two years ago when we lost a ferry for a whole month, that unsubsidised ferry service took up the slack and ensured that Orkney remained connected to Scrabster in a way that did not cost the taxpayer a penny. This demonstrates to me that Scotland has some very successful small ferry companies. And if we wish to have a successful ferry industry in Scotland, what we ought to be doing is tendering services in such a way as these small ferry companies can become involved in that process. And that's where, uh, excuse me, uh, not at the moment, but that's where I will criticise this minister and do it unashamedly for failing to live up to the expectations of those who wish to see a truly competitive tendering process on a scale 
where there was adequate unbundling to allow our small ferry companies to participate in that process. I think it's a missed opportunity, and I'm delighted to criticise this Minister for missing that opportunity and confused by the Labour Party's attitude towards this. The one thing I would ask the Minister to do, if it's still possible, is to consider if it is within his uh, power to ensure that there is some degree of market testing takes place on routes in the future. Because if we can allow small companies to demonstrate the efficiency they can generate on individual routes on a subcontracted basis, we can genuinely go forward knowing what it costs to run ferry services and knowing what the subsidy levels will need to be in future. I also need to uh, say a few things about airfares. The fact that airfares have been rising, um, largely due to the fuel costs in many cases, has been a particular disadvantage to many inner island communities. And I, like many in this chamber, will have been lobbied by those who wish to see uh, airfares restricted and the air discount scheme extended. I'm delighted that the announcement that the Minister made earlier, but it still uh, leaves people at a disadvantage when they live on the islands. Other things were mentioned during the course of the debate, including grid connections, which I don't quite have time to go into, uh, but housing uh, in particular is something which I think all governments recognise as a higher cost on the islands than it is on mainland Scotland. Rural housing is expensive, island housing is more expensive still. And I think when we talk about all the problems associated with the provision of affordable housing, the island situation needs to be right at the top of our list of priorities. The final issue, of course, that's been raised was the Crown Estate, and it's been slightly peripheral to the debate, but one or two speakers have majored upon it. And the, it is the case that the proposal to devolve the Crown Estate, uh, which came from the Smith Commission, did have with it that uh, encouragement to devolve on down to local authorities. I have to say that I understand that and I support it in principle, but I have also been heavily lobbied by people who are concerned that the expertise contained within the Crown Estate in Scotland today to close, will be please? lost if it, if it is simply divided up and passed on. So I would urge the Minister and others within the Government to consider seriously how that might be done with minimum impact to the successful and stable organisation that is the Crown Estate in Scotland. Well I now call on Ken McIntosh. Up to nine minutes, please, Mr McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, uh, I did not have the opportunity to expand on the importance of jobs uh, to the islands in my opening remarks, and I wish to briefly do so now in closing. Uh, this debate has allowed members from all sides to voice our support for more powers and greater devolution to the islands. Uh, it's clear that we want islanders to have more say over their own lives. But the proposals brought forward by the Scottish Government, uh, certainly in the motion today, do not touch on the issues that have most bearing on islanders' well-being and prosperity, their jobs, their homes, their educational and training opportunities. And I know my own personal experience of the village of Elgol in Skye, for example, is that of a community turned around by economic opportunity. Prawn fishing, and to a lesser extent, salmon and scallop farming, have given young people in the village the chance to earn a good living, to buy or more likely to build themselves a house, to bring up and look after their family and in turn boosting the local primary school role. Yes, they want more say over the decisions that affect their lives. I dare say they have a positive view on island proofing legislation and I'm sure they positively danced a jig when they heard that Mr Mackay had been appointed island's minister. But most of all, they want the opportunity to work, to earn, to look after themselves and their families and to share and contribute in Scotland's prosperity. And turning to this afternoon's debate, we've had an interesting exchange about this government's uh, devolutionary credentials. Lee MacArthur, I thought, began uh, by offering a, a critical, but I have to agree, entirely accurate assessment of the Scottish Government's approach to Scotland's islands. Essentially, that these are welcome moves from an otherwise relentlessly centralising administration here in Edinburgh. Several other members talked about the importance of reflecting the dispersed population within the islands themselves. Uh, Mary Scanlon 
said it's, it's very important that we don't just devolve power to Lerwick, Kirkwall and Stornoway. And she recounted her own experience of a visit to Stornoway in 2000. And I have to say to Ms Scanlon that um, I, I'm reliably informed that they're still recovering from that visit. Uh, but, the, uh, but she talked about the danger of, of jumping to inaccurate assumptions and of her experience of talking to uh, women from Barra. Who said, we talked about if, if they were facing the end of life that they would rather go to Glasgow than to Stormy, but the, their choice was to stay in the islands themselves. And Mike Mackenzie continued in very much the same theme that solutions which may work for Stormy do not necessarily work for, for South Uist. Uh, Mark McDougall and Mike Russell both pointed out that neither do they necessarily work for the many non Hebridean islands. In fact, I found myself uh, in danger of making common cause with Mr. Russell, uh, not just on air services, but in much of his contribution. I think he pointed out that um, he represents more islands than any other MSP. And it's worth noting that the uh, islands uh, which have recorded the greatest drop in population have been those islands uh, in Argyll and Butte uh, and North Ayrshire. Not that I'm, presenting, I'm trying to make a, a link between Mr Russell's representation uh, and, people leaving, and people leaving in droves. Uh, but uh, he, he did make a serious point that... Uh, he was disappointed that there was no representation from uh, the islands in Argyll and, and, and North Ayrshire on the ministerial working group, and I think it's something the minister perhaps should pursue uh, in terms of making an appointment. And uh, Margaret McDougall, um, uh, in talking about, similarly talking about the islands of Cumbria and Arran, uh, highlighted uh, and repeated the theme uh, in my opening remarks about the importance of housing. And I have to say that she acknowledged, which I didn't properly do, the contribution of uh, Derek Logie from Rural Housing Scotland to the cross-party group recently. Um, and she talked about the fact that with fewer houses for social rent in the islands, there's even greater need for private housing. Yet planning is difficult, uh, uh, and land ownership patterns mean that uh, little land often comes forward for development. There's poor infrastructure from the utility companies, building costs can be uh, higher, uh, the cost of materials on the ferries, for example, uh, makes them higher. And even for local housing associations, there are higher management costs in dispersed communities. Now, I suggest to the Minister that as well as the Islands Bill, there are forthcoming opportunities both in the planning, the review of planning, and in the Land Reform Bill to address this, uh, this subject. And I thought that uh, Mr Gibson made some very thoughtful remarks about the use of, uh, potential use of the Land Reform Bill. Uh, on the same theme, uh, my colleague uh, Lewis MacDonald pointed out that uh, more than half the land in uh, Neilan and Shear is now under community ownership, and it has been recognised as an important factor in encouraging people to stay or to return to the islands. But again, within the islands, there is a localised trend of movement towards the larger settlements with the population in the more outlying areas declining. And it's no coincidence that the local authorities tend only to own land which they can make available for social housing in and around these larger communities. Now, my colleague, uh, Margaret McDougall, also pointed out uh, the staggering levels of fuel poverty in the islands uh, and the Clyde. Uh, and fuel poverty is a serious problem across Scotland's islands. We know that they're often not connected to mains gas supply, far more likely to be dependent on more expensive forms of fuel, and too many in dire need of better insulation. Uh, and we certainly need to do more to ensure people do not have to live in a cold, damp home. A report last year from Scotland's rural colleges showed that, on average, 59% of people aged over 60 in rural local authorities were experiencing fuel poverty, compared to only 45% in urban areas. And the highest levels of fuel poverty were found to be in Orkney and in Newland and Shear, where a frightening 75% of over 60s were affected. Now, I, I'm not sure, but the SNP seem to have given up on achieving the target set 15 years ago of abolishing fuel poverty as far as is reasonably practical by 2016. If that is the case, the Minister should say so openly, and if not, I think he urgently needs to review the steps that he is taking, particularly on those hard-to-treat rural properties. Now, there are other, other contributions, particularly on air services. Um, I also I was particularly pleased at the remarks from Dave Thompson and Dennis Robertson. I've always dreamed of an air service to Sky, uh, and I hope perhaps uh, I can make common cause with him and Ian Blackford in making that happen. Stuart, Stephen made, Stuart Stevenson made, as usual, fascinating contribution on air services, pointing out, um, he would make a serious point about improving reliability, but he also pointed out that multi-engine planes are more dangerous than single-engine planes. I think a point he should perhaps have 
Well, I can say a point you should perhaps have made to the Minister before the Minister highlighted he has bought several two engined otters uh, for, in his opening remarks. Mr Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Um, if the member may, all these aircraft are very, very, very safe. It's merely that single engined have an extra very. Mr McIntosh, I, I, I have a point of information. I know. I absolutely. I, know, I hope the travelling public is suitably assured by these remarks. Uh, I'll be getting the ferry with Mr Gibson next time we're heading to Ireland. Uh, and I thought, uh, just before concluding, uh, presenting officer, I thought the minister was actually at his most animated this afternoon when ferries were mentioned. Uh, several times, at every contribution of ferries, he seemed to leap to his feet, except actually when Alex Johnson uh, <laughs> talked about it. Um, and I, my, my both uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret McDougall and Lewis MacDonald were simply trying to highlight that there is a great deal of anxiety. And I thought uh, my colleague Lewis MacDonald just pointed out that as Transport Minister under a Labour Liberal administration, under exactly the same EU terms of procurement, we were able to maintain and keep the ferry service in public ownership. And it's something that matters. Accountability to the public is something that matters to our islanders. And I hope the minister, because he wasn't able to offer the reassurance when he was asked this, he wasn't able to offer the reassurance that this will happen. And I hope he'll take these points on board. Sorry, uh, do I have time for Mr. Hurt? No, you haven't, no. Sorry, uh, Mr. Hurt. Um, Presenting officer, to conclude, Scottish Labour are, as, as, as is so often the case, uh, taking a constructive and consensual approach where possible to the government's proposals, but we will not shy away from highlighting the real work that needs to be done, the public services that need to be supported, the homes that need to be built, the jobs that need to be delivered, and if the government would be equally willing to work with us, then perhaps Ireland really can have a secure future. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Minister Derek Mackay to wind up the debate. Uh, Minister, you have until five o'clock. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I say, first of all, it's the Government's intention to accept the Labour amendment. So there we go. That spirit of cooperation and cross-party working has already begun. Not so the Liberal Democrat uh, amendment, uh, sadly, but I'm still sure that the constructive relationship uh, we will have uh, will continue to work for uh, island communities. I'm advised that Alistair Morrison's position in that executive at the time was Deputy Minister for Highland and Islands and Gaelic, whereas I'm Minister for Islands and the transport system in the whole country um, as well. But I'm very focused uh, on the islands issues and of course that it's right that it's connected to the transport agenda because it quite clearly is such a critical issue to our island communities. And I'm sorry to Ken McIntosh if I became in any way animated when ferries are mentioned. It's just when you spend over a billion pounds on public services you don't like people raising anxiety when it's caused by the Labour Party winding people up. I think quite unfairly about the current procurement exercise and let me say uh, I'm in no more of a position to prejudice the outcome of a procurement exercise the then executive was able to do and had to go through the exact same procurement exercise and reach uh, a conclusion. But I really want to get back to the consensus. OK, but I must move on. Scott. I completely sympathise with him, and as Ken McIntosh and I might just observe, could he maybe have a word with Fergus Ewing, because he did exactly the same scaremongering when we were going through exactly the same exercise. <laughs> Minister? Well, I'm, I'm the minister responsible for transport and conducting this exercise, but I think I have put in further safeguards around the independent procurement panel, further engagement with the trade unions uh, involved, and even on the waiting on the consideration of the procurement exercise, I do believe that I have improved the process to try and get uh, the right outcome uh, for everyone uh, involved. Can I say to Margaret uh, McDougall, first of all, I think it was a very uh, helpful uh, contribution, uh, and particularly around fuel poverty, I would want to reinforce the point that our new fuel poverty scheme heaps Warmer Homes Scotland launched on the 14th of September and has been delivered on a regional basis by the managing agent. It includes a separate island region to ensure people in more remote parts of Scotland receive the same level of service as urban areas, because I think the point was well made around uh, fuel uh, poverty particularly. Dave Thompson's given me a heads up, a warning that he's embarking on a major campaign for constituency and transport improvements and will commit to the same level of correspondence that Michael Russell uh, MSP uh, engages with around transport matters. Stuart Stevenson 
I think stretched my technical expertise in avi aviation once again, although I thought I understood the wider points around reliability, airfares, connectivity, operational matters, the relationship with HIAL. Clearly, I've got a bit more to do on the technical issue around the twin otters, but I think they're working very successfully, and I know I enjoyed the um, uh, early landing uh, on Barra. But the point made around universal service was actually well made as well, and delivery charges. That is a matter we discussed in Parliament very recently, and I responded on behalf of the Government. I'd refer uh, the Member to the remarks through that debate. Michael Russell gave a very helpful reminder uh, around the fact that there are 93 inhabited islands of Scotland, and although the, our islands are future, local authorities and campaign has been very effective. The work that we do as a government touches on all 93 inhabited island communities and that requires extra engagement on the part of the government to ensure that the commitments that are made apply to all islands as appropriate, although some are quite specific to individual islands, such as the request and the aspiration to have that constituency protection uh, for the Western Isles uh, constituency within the Scottish uh, Parliament, of course. I'm very Russell. grateful for that reassurance, which will be well received in our Gowland Butte. I wonder if I can press the Minister to go one step further and to confirm that there will be representation from our Gowland Butte in any new strategic ferry group, which he announced earlier on. Mackay? Uh, yes, there will. So the Strategic Islands uh, Forum will involve other island communities to ensure that it does reach out, so I can uh, assure uh, the member that that uh, is the case. The Islands Area Ministerial Working Group is comprised of those who came from the Our Islands, Our Future campaign. That's the nature of that forum. But I give the commitment once again as Islands Minister that I consider the engagement with all islands when making commitments and decisions around delivering on the government's prospectus. And I know a number of members have said the motion doesn't cover everything. Well, it, well, it couldn't possibly. But within the prospectus, empowering our island communities, much more is said on a whole host of other areas as to what we can do for our island communities. And there is a monitoring framework, an action plan that sets out across the portfolios about what can be achieved in partnership, focusing on the island's work. On the subject, I, I did note Jean Urquhart's comment that I, as Minister, is doing a, I'm doing a remarkably good job so far. So I look forward to the future as well. Seeing through that uh, prospectus made very valid points around culture. Ken McIntosh's point around uh, planning and land reform is well made as well, and unlocking the economic potential of local communities to deliver that sustainable future um, uh, also. Tavish Scott made the point around the legislation and the current consultation. It's achieved consensus in the Chamber today, and he said, I'm not sure where this finishes. In truth, I'm not sure where this finishes either, but surely that's a good thing in embarking on an engagement that will bring in the comments of elected members and, more importantly, local communities as to what they would like to see transferred to them from London to Edinburgh, Edinburgh to local communities and within those local communities uh, as well. So I think that's quite an exciting and open-minded uh, approach uh, to take uh, on this. And Angus Macdonald covered the, the importance of the creation of an islands minister to give that cross-portfolio focus a, across a range um, of different uh, matters. Uh, our islands, our future, uh, the leaders of that campaign would admit it was taking the constitutional uh, opportunity of the Scottish independence referendum to think about how we could do things differently. And although we didn't get the answer that we it wanted uh, as a government. We are still seeing through the commitments that we can deliver within continued devolution to support our island communities. And we've been able to do so through legislation such as the Community Empowerment Act and unlocking local potential and creating new schemes to be delivered locally. And we'll continue along that vein for the Crown Estate, where we have made a commitment uh, around the local benefits of revenues and resources deriving from local communities through the Crown Estate. Jane Baxter, I thought, was very fair when she uh, pointed out that 
the consultation on further empowerment is considered fair and reasonable. It asked a number of very pertinent uh, questions around what could be done in terms of further supporting island communities on island proofing and the policy there and Mary Scanlon's point about how that's analysed, how transparent we can be around that, on empowering our island communities, what powers would be appropriate to transfer on the potential of a national islands plan to show what government and all our agencies can do to calibrate our decisions and our investments to support island living, the issue of constituency protection for the Western Isles and of course the issue of electoral ward flexibility that with the best will in the world couldn't be implemented for 2017 but I think does represent an opportunity to take local government even closer to the people and local communities by changing the, the way we do business and having potentially fewer than three or four multi-member wards so that we can more accurately represent island communities and particularly our smaller island communities and Arran was a particularly good example of how and where that would apply. I have enjoyed a good relationship with all six local authorities. There is more to do in land reform uh, being extended for the reasons around community ownership, uh, energy, housing and digital infrastructure that I covered in my opening speech um, as well. And I look forward to the Islanders Conference where we can bring together all the Islanders uh, communities to try and share best practice and show how we can sustain local communities. And I suppose I was delighted that Alec Johnston was criticising me for not privatising the chiefs uh, in the CalMAC services as others have described. I'd happily take uh, that criticism. Simply point out in terms of aviation that this government is supporting island communities through the air discount scheme at the same time his government in the UK is undermining communities uh, with air passenger duty and that shows you the difference between the Scottish government and the UK government. In conclusion, presiding officer, today's announcements of freezing ferry fares, extending the air discount scheme from 40% to 50%, progressing the islands bill, more powers and protection, delivering, indeed, in some cases, exceeding the commitments in the island's prospectus, delivering on road equivalent tariff, the purchase of new ferries and new infrastructure, renewed focus on digital and energy, all a clear commitment to our island communities. And if today's relative consensus is anything to go by, I believe the next parliament will be very well placed to take forward legislation to support our island communities. Thank you. That concludes the debate on empowering Scotland's island communities. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 14448.2 in the name of Ken McIntosh, which seeks to amend motion number 14448 in the name of Derek Mackay on empowering Scotland's island communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 14448.1 in the name of Liam MacArthur, which seeks to amend motion number 14448 in the name of Derek Mackay on empowering Scotland's island communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14448.1 in the name of Liam MacArthur is as follows. Yes, 44. No, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 14448 in the name of Derek Mackay as amended on empowering Scotland's island communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.